Friends, if you're looking for real old school laughs, you're in for a treat because we've got them right here. Flip City Magazine. Remember Mad Magazine? Then it went woke? Well, don't worry. Flip City has no chance of going woke. That's right. Four times a year, you'll get an actual printed magazine full of jokes, stories, comics, and more, all about today's pop culture, entertainment, and woke politics. Flip City takes terrible entertainment trends we love to hate with hilarious parodies of Lord of the Rings, Stranger Things, The Walking Dead, Star Trek, Hunters, and more. Trust me when I say there is nothing else like Flip City on the market. So subscribe today. It will be delivered in print, or you can even get it digitally if you're one of those wacky Zoomers. Either way, follow our link and sign up today, and if you put in midnight, you get an extra 10% off. Check out Flip City Magazine today. After dark, and I just used up all my energy for the day. So, welcome everybody. For those who haven't noticed, I've been slightly absent from the internet most of the day. No, I did not die, but uh, I am feeling like uh, the living dead, sick as hell, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. But I'm here. I'm not very queer, but we're going to talk about some entertainment news, especially the writers who are scared. They're scared right now. Uh, we're gonna find out what's going on with that uh, as you hear maniacal laughing in the background that of course is script doctor uh who would know a thing or two about this welcome to the program oh i'm happy to be here tonight with you guys sounds like it uh <laughs> we also have with us club in time how you doing what's up, buddy? hello my dear friends on the panel and friends in the chat let's uh do some do some geeking tonight Yes, indeed. And I see some regulars in the chat. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for the well wishes. We got D Bud swinging a wrench with a Goddess of Whim so far. Hey. Thank you, guys. Uh, we also have with us 32 flavors of Nick Weiser. Uh, we're supposed to be talking some uh, longest yard later. Yeah, I think they broke his fucking yeah. neck. Told you, I think he neck. broke his fucking neck. I think they broke his fucking neck. <laughs> Told you I broke his fucking neck. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, me chat? How you all doing? Hello, panel. We got some stuff to talk about. Let's have fun. Indeed. We also have with us another Canadian, CC Karaoke. How you doing? I'm not sick. So good. I, I got all your snow today, sick. though. <laughs> no, yeah, we, we got nothing here. Winter lasted a week and then it went away. So yeah. Yeah, we woke up to I woke up after a long, long nap. To a winter's nap. I'm like, did I sleep through summer? Uh, I hope you got somebody to shovel it. Nah, I shoveled a little bit of myself just to get out. Oh, shit. That means the snow's coming for me next. Yeah, you better watch out. It's, yeah, it's still I'm going watching. here. It's, it's <laughs> slurpy, <laughs> slushy shit. Oh, I got to say, we, we had the rain all day. I'm, I'm even looking out my window right now. I can see all the rain. But now, you, now you're telling me that the snow. Oh, boy. Yeah. And uh, we also have with us, last but definitely not least, Mr. Price of Reason. How are you doing this morning, or this afternoon? It's morning for me. <laughs> I'm good. It's, uh, you're starting to sound like I ha I've been sounding for the past few weeks, and I'm getting a little bit better, I think. Yeah, you had a cold or something the last few weeks, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I was kind of really, it uh, affected me negatively for a few weeks. But now, now I'm starting to feel like I'm on the mend. And you sound like me. Or me two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sloppy seconds winner. Yeah, no kidding. And uh, yes, thank you all for, I see so many well wishes out there. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I see we have, we, we can never have enough Canadians, but uh, we actually lost a Canadian today. Um, for, uh, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to let the script lead off with this. Cause yeah, uh, Joe Flaherty passed away. Oh, well he was from Pittsburgh, but I mean, he's an honorary Canadian. 
Oh, I was going to say, I thought he was just because he was always yeah. part of like second city. Yeah. 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 Him and, and uh, he, he died at 82. Um, uh, back when I was just starting out, I knew him pretty well for a few years. Even one of my best friends uh, was taught by him at college. So um, yeah, it, it was, he, he was, you know, he lived a long life. He definitely made a huge impact in the comedy scene. He's one of the most recognizable character actors in the industry. Um like if you see him, I mean, he's most people know him from Happy Gilmore as the jackass guy. But people that actually seen more than one movie know him from like Back to the Future 2, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, Maniac Mansion, SCTV, like we just SCTV, said, yeah, of course, and using King, of, King of Queens. Um, he, he uh, you know, um, uh, Freaks and Geeks was a show that he actually adored. He always wanted that show to continue because he really loved doing that. Wasn't he uh, cut out of Little Shop of Horrors? Is he the one I'm thinking of? No, he was definitely cut out of uh, Anchorman, Anchorman, the first Anchorman okay. film. Because um, I, I know that when they brought John Belushi in to reshoot the ending, I thought he was the one who originally was trying to buy the plant from him, but they couldn't get him back. But maybe it was somebody else I'm thinking of. If I'm wrong, I apologize. But yeah, no, Count Floyd, that's the one that everybody, yeah. Yeah, Floyd. Uh, <laughs> Floyd, Ron, Floyd was the I best. Floyd? Yeah. Hmm? Floyd was the best because it was because it was like it was based off of a Canadian broadcaster named Floyd Richards, uh, Lloyd Richardson. I think him was Floyd Richardson. And he did the regular news news bit with Eugene Levy. Uh, and then he would do the the, the creepy movie m- night uh, thing Ooh. where he the joke was that uh, he did not know what a vampire was. And that's why he howled. <laughs> the beginning. Ooh. Yeah, that was, and I then would that. end up, you know, finding out, yeah, we don't have the scary movie or I have to improvise a scary movie or it wasn't that scary. And John Candy would come on to do stuff and he'd try, do the running gig uh, gag was he Floyd would be selling 3D glasses by mail and changing the price all the time so that he could get paid because SCTV, of course, was a very cheap, cheaply run network. That was the joke. Um, he was a really charming, humble guy. Uh, it was miraculous when I got to interact with him every time he would get, uh, like an offer for a gig and he didn't know if he wanted to take it or not because he'd have to, you know, fly to LA or wherever they were shooting for a little bit. You'd always, you'd be like, ah, do I want to do it? Am I good enough to do it? And you know, myself and some of my colleagues be like, yeah, of course, man, it's work. If they want you take it. And he would be like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. (laughs) And then he'd go. And I think he, it was a couple of times he was, uh, being the, uh, the preacher or the priest on King of Queens, the, um. Uh, that that sitcom there, uh, he'd always uh, expressed a little bit of doubts of that. But then once he did it, he would have a lot of fun. So he he was a great guy. Uh, I, I've met his children. They're wonderful. I think his oldest is getting in his is uh, started acting as well, which he's probably in his early 20s by now. Um, we're a little bit older. Uh, but yeah, he's uh, he will be missed. Uh, he's he's now you know joining the the great afterlife with his older brother Dave, who is a mentor of mine and and a good friend as well. So um, he, he won't be forgotten. Definitely in the Canadian world of comedy, he will never. That's be why I guess I assumed he just assumed he was Canadian because like I knew you said you even kind of knew of him through vicariously and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he he worked with George Lucas on Maniac Mansion for a few seasons. Um, but he's he's an honorary Canadian of sorts, and any time. I mean, he was in that 70s show with Dave Thomas where they both played Mounties. <laughs> and That's the true, funny yeah. thing is that he wasn't he wasn't Canadian, but he could do a heck of a good, you know, northern Canadian uh, accent. And yeah, charming, wonderful guy. Uh, there should be some recent interviews of him on YouTube out there because um, he, he did a bunch of Zoom calls and stuff. And he, mm. he he did start to look his age, but he still had that energy about him. So it's uh it's sad that he he passed away, but he picked a good day to pass away. Every comedian wants to pass away on April Fool's because <laughs> it means that they went laughing, or at least there's something funny about. Everybody's it. questioning whether or not it actually happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I'm sure Andy Kaufman wished that he would have died on April Fool's Day, but no, he will be missed. And yeah, looking at his uh, filmography here, just tons Epic. and tons of stuff. And Stripes, he was, he was also in. That was the other one I was trying to remember. Stripes. Yeah. And he was, I mean, he was never 1941 of, too. He was never the type of guy that felt he was too big for his britches. Like that, that was one of the things that was cool. Like I remember years later, I'd bump into him on the streets of downtown Toronto and he, first of all, he remembered my name, which was awesome because, you know, uh, you interact with so many people over your life to be able to have that as something cool. Um, but yeah, he was just like, he wore, you know, he was never the, the glitz glamour, the egotist or anything of that nature. He was a very like, cool humble guy grateful that he got recognized always took time out for for some people but uh always and also had a really good um 
uh, sense of, of privacy. Like when he was out with his kid, he'd be like, yeah, I'll say hi to you, whatever. But, uh, and, but then he'd be, Oh, there's one time he was with his son and, and I was, I was with him too. Cause we we're doing a little comedy bit and a person came up to him and said, hi. And he says, Hey, we're doing this comedy bit. Tell me your name. I'll put you on the list for free. And then you can meet afterwards. Cause I'm with my kid right now. And that's what he did. And cause he's like, oh, you know, that's cool. cause he didn't want to, you know, be, you know, rude to a fan, but he also wanted to, you know, shelter his kid a little bit from that type of aspect. And, uh, he was he was a fun guy like that, and other other talent from the SCTV crew did similar things as well. He, they they did a lot. So, yeah, if you want to get some good laughs, uh, go check out some of his old SCTV yeah. sketch sketches, and you know, pop in a film he's in. He's also in probably have a lot of them. <laughs> say the one that the one that I grew up with him in had to be Follow That Bird. That probably was the first place I remember because he had a pretty prominent role in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that'd be the Sesame Street movie for those who don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, like you said, he was he's been in so many comedies, everything from Club Paradise to One Crazy Summer, Inner Space. Uh, who's Harry Crumb? Used, used cars. Used yep, cars. cars. Like as you mentioned, Back to the Future Two, he plays the uh, uh, he plays the Western, Western Union, Union Western yeah. Union guy. Yeah, I was gonna say oh, Wells Fargo. Right. I mean, that's not it. It's Western Union. Yeah. yeah. Um, he even reprised he in- those voices for Family Guy at the behest of Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> <laughs> He was in Stewart yeah. Saves His Family, and of course, as mentioned, Happy Gilmore. Um, he was in Police Academy, the series, actually. Yes, the 26 episodes. Series. Yeah. yeah, he was in Detroit Rock City, he, where he also played a priest. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he's in tons and tons. I mean, the list just goes on. I could go on for the next five, he's ten minutes. He's got over 100 here. credits, I'm pretty sure. I yeah. haven't been to be recently, but like. I mean, yeah, just tons and tons of stuff. So even that Back to the Future thing, it's such a brief thing, but it's a memorable part of the movie. So if there's conventions, I'm sure he could have gone there and people would have wanted pictures with the Western Union guy. Even if he didn't have this big career, just that alone is uh is well, he's he's iconic just for being the the jackass guy from (laughs) yeah Happy Gilmore alone, right? Right. Like I, I guess even from that, he's iconic, but. Uh, I even give value to that ending of Back to the Future too because it's such an important part of the movie, and then yeah. it carries over into the third one. And Back to the Future is a really, really big trilogy. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. He will be missed. Um, but yeah, anybody else want to say anything before we move on here? Godspeed, man. Rest well, Joe. R.I.P. Great. That's it. Love him on SCC, SCTV and a lot of other stuff. And uh, yeah, and I also city. <laughs> want to acknowledge the uh, passing of uh, um, Ed Pisker. Is that how you say his name? Because yeah, I was not, I'm not K-Fabe. very Cartoon familiar with him. Yeah, yeah um, I know some of you guys are, are familiar with him. So if you guys wanted to say anything quick, that's up to you. But yeah, personally, I don't know him. And I the, the, the story he, is sad. So yeah. Yeah, it was as far as to address his work. He did it. He really didn't. He, he, did, he was on. He was part of some uh, like a, a popular YouTube cast. His, his comic book work was mostly known for X Men Grand Design, which was um, kind of an odd kind of a duck. Really, it was a. It was sort of a, in his own kind of strange cartoony style, a walk through historically like almost like a docu docu drama of sorts in the comic form, of uh, in this case. The uh, Marvel Universe from about the, the X Men, like a history of the X Men of all the the important uh, moments in X Men history. And he did a couple of them. They did he did like two or three different ones: X Men Grand Design, Grand Design Extinction, and one or two others. Marvel had other books like that for the Fantastic Four, but that was Tom Cioli. But it was Pisker who did the X Men one. And other than that, I think he got his work working for Harvey Picard and a couple of other things. But so oh, okay. um, he did have one, I think, America Splendor story, but. Other than that, I don't know. He, he didn't do a lot of comics, but he's been around a while, and he's you know he's done art for. He's had some hip hop family comic or whatever that was not like one of the big publishers or anything that was he was famous for. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, he he had he is definitely in the good graces of guys like the Liefelds and the McFarlands of the world. And yeah, he he definitely had his respect, and he definitely he paid his dues, and he definitely had a successful YouTube channel at that as well. Well. And, yeah, and he got this a uh, big sad story from there. He was kind of part of the Whisper Network and some of those things as well. But mm-hmm. uh, and you know the big company and everything. But yeah, he, it was a sad. Uh... 
Yeah. Yep. I it's I I don't want to say too much more. It's just right now, it's just like it's. Yeah, it's I have a feeling we may enough. talk about this at a later date in a different yeah, context. I, so I think right now, it's, I very, it's very early right now. I didn't want to. Yeah, I didn't want to dwell on it too much. I didn't want to dig into the nitty gritty. Uh, the, the I just figured it'd be. I give you guys a chance to say something. Who are the comic book guys? And and for those in the um, chat to have a moment to say RIP and whatnot. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'll be something we we talk about at a later date. Now is not the time, though. I don't think. I, I'd agree with that. Yeah. It's it's really kind of. It's, I mean, it was yesterday for God's sake. The family's yeah. obviously going through a lot. Yeah, yeah, and that was a big part of it too, from my understanding. Again, and I'm not fully aware of the whole situation. I wasn't too familiar with him, and I apologize. So like. No, but I do know that he was being hounded by the press and some other stuff too. So I don't want to add to that shit. So like, yeah, I just no. want to give you guys a moment to say something if you wanted to, and that'd be it. So, yeah. Yeah. I understand. All right. So with that, uh, let's, uh, get past, uh, the sad news of the day and get into the fun news of the day. Cause, uh, <laughs> this is why I'm glad script is here. The writers are scared. Why it's wow. a brutal time to be a TV writer. According to, uh, Hollywood reporting here. Uh, the end of the peak TV has ushered in an era of contraction with fewer buyers. Farewell, the CW and fierce competition for few shows that are staffing. People are total survival mode. Yeah. I mean, I got to imagine even Netflix isn't green lighting everything like they used to. Um, they barely really green lit everything uh, like then. people did, did at then either. Like that was the joke was that they're doing it just because some of the shows they were putting together were, um not high concept shows so they're just saying oh, oh they green light everything but like no netflix has their own their own model uh the fascinating aspect about this article written by leslie goldberg is that she's only really interviewing people who suck at writing um <laughs> <laughs> uh when you take a look at some of the names that are brought up here uh i think one of them of, of at the top is emily Sh Shavier's. Uh, who she is known for writing Legends of Tomorrow and ABC's oh. The Company You Keep, which are not good shows no. at all. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I see a bias going on here. Essentially, this is what's happening is uh, what I basically not necessarily 100% predicted, but what I said would most likely happen on a Midnight's Edge in the Morning show uh, shortly after the NBA was ratified. And I think even John Trent wrote an article about that. Um, is that yeah, we're going to see a purge of bad writers because those that can get shows sold and those that can staff rooms are not going to be hiring the people that have basically brought this industry down. Uh, and the way that they brought it down is by capitulating to the ideology, um, whether that was something they absolutely believed in or whether it was something they just decided to do so that they could get the work. They are now, um, to put it in you know better terms, the chickens are coming home to roost. So all I can say is, listen, if you were good at your jobs, we wouldn't be here in the first place. <laughs> and second of all, the industry right now is trying to figure out what steps they're going to do now that they finally learned after many years um, of struggling, they're trying to figure out what to do with streaming. And it looks like they finally got into the right uh, men mindset, which is what myself, Tom, and several others have said, which is if they start in, in adopting the network model, they will probably start to make money again, which means it's ad supported video on demand via a streaming service. Um, once they start figuring out what that is going to be, and once they start finishing calculating what those residuals are, are going to be so that they can do their, uh, their fiscal quarterly budgets, then they will start buying again. And that buying will probably start happening in September of this year. Uh, and in the meantime, if you're a terrible writer, especially one featured in this article, and there's a couple of showrunners that went anonymous, probably because everybody in town knows that they're crap, um, they they will have to start looking for other work or getting better at their craft. Ideally, you want to get better at your craft, but if you can't shed the ideology and very things that caused show, uh, networks like CW to lose more money faster, um, then maybe you shouldn't be in this industry. Yeah. So let's uh, let's let's run through this quick. I don't even know how long it is, but uh, let's just uh, see. It's like six paragraphs, six seven paragraphs. It's all right. You know, Emily Cleaver's career was just getting started. The 36-year-old began her TV writing career in 2020 as a writer's production assistant and script coordinator for Legends of Tomorrow before getting hired as a staff writer for ABC's The Company You Keep. After the drama that marked... Oh, go ahead. 
I'm saying imagine that that's like the big break. She was the <laughs> assistant of the assistant on Legends of, Legends of Tomorrow, a show that seems like it was written by a five year old. At and then the there's age, the bottom of the barrel shit. Yeah. The bottom, the total at then. the age of 32. Yeah. At the age Remember, of 32. She's 36 years old now. Four years ago was 2020. She was 32 when she finally got her first writing gig. What happened? What was going on in peak 2020? Diversity, <laughs> equity, inclusion. Mm-hmm. Which means that if she was writing, you know, say 15 years or 12 years up until that point and not getting anywhere, that means she mm-hmm. sucked. Because right. again, if you're a good writer, you're your gender, your appearance does not hold you back. Kind of like that Superman and Lois writer that was crying racism. Uh, I mm-hmm. before the show took off. Uh, well, yeah. I wouldn't say took off, but before the show uh, debuted. Even aired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because she was all like, racism, racism. I'm a good writer, racism. Maybe Pa Kent should be black. This is the first <laughs> example they have in the article. If they would have at least started with somebody that's like, she, I work for Martin Scorsese and was an assistant producer on the film. This At least you say, okay, this person has worked somewhere. But her big claim to fame is that she was uh, the assistant of the assistant on Legends of Tomorrow. That's wow. really a bad way to start off this article. No, so that's not, that's to, not uh, something to be proud of. No, no. Wait, you get terrible. to like Kyo Shimizu. <laughs> the, the, this could, once again that now imagine how many assistants have assistants on bigger shows because if this is like the the d list bottom of the barrel show from the cw just imagine how much worse it is on the bigger shows like look at all, all, all the money that's being spent on a cw show that absolutely and i don't think they ever made profit at one point I mean, correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think they have ever even turned a profit how much worse it is for the bigger shows if the little shows that were failing were doing all this? Well, the, the bigger shows didn't have the decline in numbers that the CW had. So, well, that, there, that much a little is bit true. of quality going yeah. on. The problem being is that terrestrial network television for our generation and generations uh, following us doesn't really watch TV. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there are three shows titled Chicago dealing with first responders or something of that nature right now mm-hmm. that are huge among the 45 and older demographic. Is that conclu- um, including Chicago and Chicago fire, Chicago fire, fire, Chicago PD, PD and Chicago okay. med, I think are the three. Okay. Um, those are procedurals. They're safe. They, they barely have any of the type of ideology in them because they just don't have time to do it. Um, and, and they're, they're better stepping stones for getting a writing career, like procedurals than, mm-hmm anything at the cw the cw is basically hey dawson's creek was huge let's take that model and apply it to everything that we have at warner brothers and paramount for the next 20 years (laughs) and and you know i know a lot of people love supernatural out there i have my own gripes with it for a couple of reasons first being Mm -hmm. that the writer stole that idea from another writer i knew very well um Mm -hmm. and then did it horribly because it was supposed to be a comedy and they took it into a drama um but at the same time like they they had a model that allowed it to sustain itself and i mean the funny part too is that the reputation was that if you came out of a cw writer's room you ended up show running a cw writer's room that was only pla- like that's the only place you're going to get to work really <laughs> like it, it wasn't a place where you could grow i don't i can't think of any hit writers and barely can you find any celebrities that truly came out of a cw show maybe at warner brothers when it was warner brothers before uh, paramount cbs got involved you could make a couple of arguments, but once CW hit CW, they were all like, that's it. That's your dead end, man. And it ended up being true. Like, do you really think you're going to see, um, uh, Bitsy, uh, Elizabeth Tollock, Bitsy Tollock in any shows after, uh, after this right now, even Justin, um, Hartland, who is in, this is, this is us as at NBC. Uh, he's back doing like a CW level show with the tracker that nobody's mm-hmm. watching. Um, it, it's not really going to like, it's not, I mean, I'm glad the network's gone because it really just basically says, if you want to be, you know, prof uh, good, successful in this career, you have to be able to write better than a failed TV network. And the failed TV network was there to really just embolden those that sucked uh, to spew out content for years. And mm, they weren't trying to spew out content saying, no, Barry, you're not the flesh. We run, are run the Flash. Barry. Yeah, we are the Flash. Run, Barry, <laughs> Flash, yeah. Legend of Tomorrow, and all the stuff that they were doing there. 
Um, let me uh, let, let me read this though before we go too deeper sure. into this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we yeah. didn't let After, you read even one word. Yeah, you, just you said didn't it. literally get very you far. Yeah. <laughs> uh, follow up to This Is Us was canceled following a se- single season shortly after the Writers Guild of America strike began last May. Cleaver had no job to return to when it ended in September. Imagine that. Like we warned y'all. Like scores of other writers of all levels and all backgrounds, she doesn't know when or where the next paycheck will come from. People are scared. To, welcome to America. Uh, people are scared trying to go back to bartending. She says a lot of people are wondering what other jobs they can do. I'm close to my old showrunners and they're supportive of me, but they are looking for jobs. Yeah, across yeah, the suck. TV land. Well, not <laughs> How just that. Is bartending this is, a bad job. I know. Well, <laughs> this is the <laughs> thing. That's, job, like uh, I've worked in restaurants. That's the job everybody in the restaurant works. Like that's like, no, they want well, to work. It's remember, like, it's you, you have to work at the, the restaurant for twenty been... years to get in with the owners so that you can be the bartender you know come on but but cc it's california that was shut down egregiously during the pandemic all those bars oh, don't yeah, exist yeah. anymore so you got like three <laughs> bars and six thousand uh oh, wait. you know terrible writers that want to be bartenders to uh you know su- supplement their income it's not so that's why california has gone gone down because there's oh no it bars. was uh it was a it was a chain reaction i remember i think you said something like this to the same effect script was like you know like the, the, all these places are shutting down because there's no work to be had on either end because they don't have the meetings. So they don't have the restaurants in working order and all this. Other stuff. Yeah. And the strike was going on post pandemic. So what few did open up were struggling as it was because there was no business going on in town. That's right. And then the other part too, is the, the downsizing of show orders started two months before the strikes even began because they realized, cause again, they finally got the data and that streaming was not paying off as well on a subscriber only basis. So they had to figure something out. And I can't imagine script that writers like, I mean, she's talking like, look, and I remember this during the actor strike. It's like, yeah, a good 80% or roughly of actors don't have sustainable careers. They generally have to find other work outside of that, be it voice work, be it working on a radio station, be it working as a, as a waiter or a bartender. Sometimes, or the worst know? job all being an acting coach or an acting teacher for the next <laughs> <Yeah>. generation. <laughs> Something like that, right? So, like, it was, that, that was already a, a, a situation where if you weren't part of that top twenty percent of actors that were working nonstop, you probably did have to 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 find another way to to make ends meet, especially living in California. Has it not been that way for for writers too all these years that you got to kind of supplement your income in between, or are you guys generally working that steady? What's the deal here? Why are they panicking all of a sudden? I guess is my question. Well, up until the the t- the, sm- the shorter seasonal runs, yes, you were working pretty steadily, even if you were just starting. Okay, out. I can like, see that. Yeah, when you're doing a 22 episode a season, whether or or 35 if it's a half hour, but usually on day on average it was 22 for an hour or a half hour show. Um, that was majority of the year, and you would have an, an off season where or a few months where you'd either try and pitch another show or you pitch a screenplay or what have you. In the Which meantime, would be spring, then, right? Uh, yeah, usually, well, be yeah, end of spring and mostly the summer. Um, right. and then, or not mostly this, well, end of spring. And then, you, you know, right in the middle of summer, you get back to, to work ish. That's what I was figuring is yeah. your schedule is not the same as what we do with television. It's kind of like six no, months off, right? Cause or sometimes three they start, or depending on the type of show, if it's an hour long, they usually start shooting, uh, late July, early August, right. their October premiere. And if it's a half hour, it's a little bit closer to September. Uh, and then the writing part of that is usually three months prior to it. So sometimes you could be going on, you'd be going on your, your off point in. Yeah. Like April, but sometimes it'd be maybe a month or two later, depending on the, the scheduling. But yeah, usually around like, spring, but that's a good point. And, and yeah. spring to so early summers when you're kind of off to do other stuff, but yeah. So that's a good point. Yeah. The change of the actual the season of television point has yeah. changed and and i don't i can't even think of any shows anymore really that run the the 22 the episodes 22? a year except no, for mean, maybe a few network shows and that's about it yeah and, and the worst part is is that prior to just before the 2007 strike is when the 24 to 26 episode season went down to 22 and and writers were upset about that because again that's you know four paychecks that they're not not getting um and yeah so the the uh, the downsizing has never been a writer's issue um like like for their something that they lobbied for it's always been on the studio side things we don't want to produce you know 22 episodes we want to do 12 or 13 we think those are better especially because they're trying to ape hbo which has seasons that were maybe only 13 episodes a season because it was a prestigious high higher budget show 
some of the networks wanted to ape that. Um, again, it's it's all about the fact that like whoever sets whoever blazes the trail, everyone else wants to follow, and you cannot capture someone else's lightning in, in a bottle and, and do it for yourself. Uh, the networks uh, outside, because again, Warner Brothers was HBO, even though they didn't have a network itself that was dedicated to them, the television that they made on HBO was considered top tier, a list, the best of the best of TV. Um, FX was something else. So they, they had a partnership in with Fox at the time. Uh, that was also your, your more accessible television as, as well. Uh, along with AMC for a degree, uh, for a period. So those were the ones that were trying to do the prestigious television and everything else was considered regular, but it was also 22 episodes a season. So everybody got to work. When those networks decided to say, you know, we're going to cut back on our procedural, procedural season length, we'll cut back on our comedy show length because people aren't watching television, the frequency. So we want to kind of concentrate it with like 10 or 13 episodes. That's when things started to really change. And that was a couple of years after the 07, 08 strike. And yeah with streaming coming into effect and then what Netflix was doing where they were having eight episode seasons and 10 episode seasons mm -hmm. and they were getting huge numbers and huge popularity really quick. Again, the networks made the terrible thing of trying to copy that. And what ended up happening is that they were, they were downsizing um, the length of the shows and increasing the production of other shows, which caused a, a weird type of inflation. So instead of having 150 shows a year, then went up to 300 after a few years. And then up until, just before 2023, it was 600 a year. So you have all these shows which are basically diluting the market and, and making it so difficult for, for audiences to find a good show um, that many of them would only go through a single season before they're being canceled canceled because nobody is watching them. Because unfortunately, in the in the studios and networks pursue and uh, need to uh, uh, provide content instead of entertainment, they oversaturated the market and hurt a lot of people that actually had some probably great shows out there. And, um, and the other part too, is when you have that many shows, you're picking up writers from everywhere to try and fill in those gaps. But when you also have an ideology on the studio side of things being pushed forward, you're now not picking the writers that are going to make those shows successful. You're just picking the writers that fit your ideology so that you can score your points and advertise to your friends over, you know, drinks hey yeah i got this show look at that a whole diverse cast only one white guy he's not even straight look at that we're a win you know those types of things and when mm -hmm. audiences number one you have an oversaturated market and then how is the audience that would like that show going to find it anyways uh so yeah you have a lot so of yeah there. so that aside like obviously we'll give them that excuse or give writers that excuse that yeah the, the 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 tv landscape has changed things are not the same as they used to be not even five years ago let alone ten um that part is true but at the same time i mean i would imagine that part of the job you job you have as a writer and i'm sure you know this more than anything being a script doctor is you got to make yourself useful right so if you're yeah. not working on something you got to be working on something else and even oh, if you're not getting paid i imagine you should be working on something else just in case so you can have always because that's one thing i was always always told when i first got into writing too was like always have like three or four things because they're never going to take the first thing that you come in and say usually Right. Well, so the odds of them taking the first thing, yeah, are very are very slim. Um, but no, you're you're absolutely right. Like I, I, <laughs> that was the thing that I, I talked about when the writer strike happened. All these writers that were on social media, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, what have you, protesting and and protesting longer than they needed to um, on the streets, weren't writing. And me and some of my friends and colleagues, we were all pounding away just trying to get scripts ready because we know that as soon as the and the strike ends, Hollywood is going to need content to fill. And, you know, I, I got fortunate enough. I, a couple of my specs that I wrote over that period um, landed me a development uh, gig that I did up here in Canada, which has just ended. So we're now waiting to see if it's going to get picked up and put into a pilot or not. So I'm on the waiting list. I'm on the wait for that. But in the meantime, I'm still plugging away writing other stuff. And I also am fortunate enough that I managed to pick up a consulting job with an AI company. So they're paying me so that I don't have to be in a position like this uh, hack of a writer who has no other skills besides bartending to contribute to, uh, to their, to their own income. So, yeah, let, let me keep uh, reading along here. Cause I'm sure there's more, maybe we'll get a little bit farther this time. <laughs> um, You're in the second paragraph now. I think so. <laughs> People are scared. Blah, blah, blah. I got all that. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, we got that one. Across the TV landscape, buying is cool dramatically, and many TV writers now find themselves in a situation like Cheever. Uh, with opportunities shrinking in the industry, in the industry shifts from peak TV to an era of contraction and austin austerity. Uh, a wave of downsizing that kicked off last year when the priorities of Wall Street changed from focus on subscribers' growth to profitability. Oh, imagine that. As streamers like Netflix and Max right size their slates, right right size that's a new word right size i've never heard of that one right that size mean, that's a, a sailing <laughs> term after you've capsized you want to right size your boat yeah i was gonna say so they're actually okay we overdid Using it at first. now term. yeah <laughs> yeah now we need to 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 actually be more realistic here is i think what they're trying to say yeah. uh and, and uh the broadcast pipeline for peacock hulu and paramount plus are drying up a decade ago broadcasters com- collectively ordered as many as 98 pilots today that number can be counted on one hand that's there are so few sh- <laughs> that's a bit hyperbolic i was gonna say yeah. yeah that one hand part no there's there's probably 60 that i know of in in works right now that are tentative to be a go uh which yeah it's shorter but i mean it's it's nowhere near like we counted on one hand unless they're referring to the writers that this particular journalist is interviewing I'll only able to count uh, them getting a pilot on one hand because again, these are not good writers. Yeah. Cause like, I mean, I, maybe I could believe one network or one streaming service is downsized to just a handful of correct, but not like the entire fucking industry. That's bullshit. And to take the entire industry numbers to, cause they even say collectively. And then they try to present it here. It's like, yeah, I don't buy that. Uh, anyway, there are so many shows that are still being greenlit, so few pilots that are being ordered, so few spots in writers' rooms. Well, when you got all the producers taking, or writers are actually producers now, what do you expect? Uh, Alex Kurtzman, etc. 27 producers on uh, Star Trek Discovery. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> see how many uh, more they'll get for the fifth season. <laughs> yes, yeah, says Shannon Corbeil, the finalist uh, for the D- Disney TV Writing Fellowship that is put on hold during the WGA strike. The staffing positions available are going more seasoned writers and pilots that are being purchased are being bought from proven writers. That's the way it's always been. Yes. You know, they're, they're finally the hiring uh, writers. Well, yeah. Remember, who is this person? Someone that needs Disney to get a leg up in the industry. Like that has always been the case. Like I remember growing up, you had your certain, I mean, even just as recent as a decade ago, Chuck Lorre or whatever was one of the guys that, you know, he yeah. did you'd have your big showrunner guys that would come up with your ideas for your shows. And then that's where you'd work your way through the ranks, the Simpsons yep. and all that kind of stuff back in the day. Like Jim, Jim Burroughs, one of the most famous of showrunners from the eighties did cheers. was also the director of most of those episodes. He was the guy, but yeah, I'm trying to think of names like Stephen J Canal and, mm-hmm. uh, Botchko and, uh, some of these other guys back in it. Those were your main dudes, right? Like those are, and, and women, I'm sure there was a few, I'm not trying to be all, misogynistic here but i'm just saying like you worked for those people for years right and then you worked your way up the ranks and then eventually maybe just maybe you came up with your own pilot and boom you know it just happens like it's i i don't understand this idea where they think they're just going to come in and be able to sell a pilot i just don't get it they were spoiled by uh, an era that made no sense and now they're delusional which is on brand for the type of people that these hires are to begin with that aren't that don't seem to be even good at writing then they're delusional and that's what they, this article seems like it sounds like a bunch of coping delusional people a- and i've been in situations before uh, i don't have the same background as script but even in hollywood settings and a lot of times they'll really bullshit each other with nonsense to explain <laughs> something and i feel like this this article is the epitome of that Rather than facing what is really happening, everybody's dancing around the truth here uh, due to a lot of kind of uh, politics and and things like that that were not based on merit. And due to the fact that there was just too many projects and too many streaming services, uh, a lot of people somehow were employed and maybe were misled to think that as the third assistant on Legends of Tomorrow, maybe there's something special. But it turns out that now when the going is tough and there isn't money, uh, these bigger companies want to find people that actually have a track record, which which makes sense on a business level. But these guys here, uh, they're, they're kind of, it's a shell shock for them. Yes, because they're being left behind. Like I have been working in this industry since 2006. 
10 years into this industry, I was working, I was doing uh, rewrites, I was pitching feature films, I was trying to get staffed on a show. When 2016 happened, there's no way I was going to get staffed on a show, but I was definitely available to help a lot of people that sucked help work uh, work through their their stuff. And, you know, coming in, doing quick rewrites of scenes uh, in, in a pension emergency and then being told, yeah, I mean, listen, we'd love to get you on the show, but we just don't have it in the budget or there are other excuses because they would never tell me directly to my face is because of my appearance and my my sexual preference. Um, and, and some of them, even if they didn't care for that, were not in a position of power to even say, you know, tell the studios or tell the powers that be to go to hell and just put me on now. Well, and that basically takes us, yeah. As I say, and that basically takes us back to about five ish years ago when you first bopped into our uh, sphere here. And that's kind of the story you had then is that I they, was wondering, am I, am I terrible at my job? But why, if I am, why am I still getting working? And then I explored stuff on YouTube and social media to be like, here are my thoughts. Am I crazy? And the vast majority said, no, you're not crazy. So, well, I, I'm still saying the jury's out on that. I could be insane, but for, for now, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> for now, um, this is it, why yeah, let's keep going here because there's. Oh, boy, this is longer than I thought. Never mind. I want to um, summarize it if if you'll allow me. I actually oh, read shit. it, and the one thing that really yes, please summarizes <laughs> this whole article. There's a part that one of the people that were interviewed they said that the one of the biggest problems in Hollywood is that the CW collapsed because the CW was open to hiring so many of these writers. And now that it's gone, uh, you don't have those kind of CW shows that are hiring these people. And to me, that's just one big joke because CW, and this is just a lack of a better, uh, for lack of a better, better phrase, it's the total get woke, go broke station. And all these people that they hired for what you said, that kind of Dawson's Creek or script said it, I don't know, that nonsense that they did there, it all collapsed. And then I guess that was the biggest source of hiring all these people that were rather incompetent. I don't know why yes. it's funny, but that's a funny part of the article. And it's one of the final things that's written in it. That is one of the final things. But I'll read this paragraph uh, that also sums it up to show you that the industry is going in a more um, merit-based direction. So you have Kido Shimuzi, who works steadily since breaking into the industry in 2010 with credits that include Being Human. That's a J.J. Abrams show that sucked. Arrow. That's a Greg Berlanti show that sucked. And show running Legends of Tomorrow. That's another Greg Berlanti show that sucked. She was told by her reps that networks and streamers would start buying again after the calendar turned to 2024. Well, that's them coping. It's been three months and no one can get anything sold, she says, as she juggles five different projects, all of them based on IP, which means she has no original thought in her head, with the hopes that one will eventually find a buyer. For writers who are trying to pay their bills, it's really scary because we only make money if things sell. As a showrunner who is a queer woman of color and I can't get work, that's saying Bingo. Well, it's very <laughs> that Bingo, is, that's the this, thing. This is what I tell told guys on this show and on Midnight Sedge in the Morning and other shows. This was going to happen. You're only going to hear people complaining who are the very people that are causing you problems with your entertainment, um, especially on the executive side of things. So that's all she had. To, to her credits like she started after me and she got way better opportunities but had nothing to do with her being a good writer imagine that doing, but she explained exactly what it was and again you're talking jj abrams and greg berlanti greg berlanti who is an acolyte of uh alf alga alga yeah algoff and miles miller who did smallville who is basically a, a ground zero for the woke team based superhero shows and they're now doing yeah. they did wednesday which a lot of people liked i thought it was okay and they're also doing beetlejuice beetlejuice they're the writers of beetlejuice beetlejuice oh boy oh, that being directed by tim burton so we will see what happens there when that comes out but when you get someone like greg berlanti who is a uh, one of the biggest producers at the time because he had a number of shows on cw and he's also uh, an openly gay man who claims to love comics, but clearly does not love them enough to keep them, uh, you know, a little bit more in line with their character. Um, yeah. Arrow exactly. being huge. And then, of course, Flash being the, the close follow up of the ultimate betrayals. Um, he's actually over at Universal right now, barely scraping by with some of the shows he's doing. Uh, and that's just because the model he used that worked for CW, especially when they did their packages and international sales to other territories, doesn't work for for Universal because they don't sell that way. They don't make stuff that way. They make stuff traditionally NBC bad, not CW bad. 
I think that he was sneaky too. In in both Arrow and Flash, what he did was he made a first season that was somewhat reasonable. You could watch the first season of The Flash or the first season of Arrow and think this is a pretty decent comic book show. And and I was fooled. Those first season, maybe second season tops, but once you get into that second season, everything changes. It just becomes more and more agenda. Yeah, the driven. first two, three seasons were fine. Yeah. Then it became I, soap opera well, slash. It was the frogs in a boiling pot and a slow boiling pot of water. Like when, um, (laughs) when the, 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 when the flash pilot was circulating around and I read, I'm like, well, this seems like the the feature film just repurposed. And I was, I was right on that. And then when I found out, Oh, the, their pitch for it was, uh, cause Sherlock on the BBC was huge. They said, we want to do Sherlock for the flash. And if you take a look at the pilot, they even do some of the overlays of special effects for like, you know, the, the detective work that Barry is. Yep. They never yes, did it after that. They never did it after that because they realized how yeah. expensive it was and CW didn't have the budget for it. So well, they did was they said, okay, we're going to abandon everything that we can. Some of the writers of that first season ended up uh, just moving on to other projects. Uh, There's another writer on there. He's okay. I don't really like him too much because his parents are hippies. His, his name is Speedweed. That's his actual name. <laughs> I remember <laughs> that. I remember that guy. Um, <laughs> he, he was uh, helming that show for for a time being, and oh, that was kind of like when it started to decline right away. Well, and that's, I also remember. Mm-hmm. I remember the first season set up that they were clearly going to go towards uh, uh, Flashpoint. Yes. And then I remember in the background was when they yeah. were first saying, okay, we're going to do a flash movie, but we're using the flashpoint story. So the show had to completely deviate from there. And I was like, I'm trying to remember about where it was. I think it was like midpoint through second season or something like that. Oh, it's end. pretty much. Yeah. Some or yeah. something like that. And pretty much where the show kind of went off the rails. And then they did a half-assed version of it. I think it's season three. And at that it point, all, I think they it was it. done. I thought they were well, yeah. near. I hate thinking points, back yeah. on it, you're right, Clobby. Because after talking to you guys about that. it and thinking about certain things about it, I'm like, I like certain aspects of it. But at the end of the day, Flashpoint doesn't make any goddamn sense. No, a Flash uh, nope. boom thing doesn't make any goddamn People sense. Like it, uh, That's not how it. the Force works. I mean, <laughs> Back to the Future, I think, got it pretty accurate. <laughs> I mean, even yeah. most physics scientists or whatever you say, call them. We'll say, yeah, Back to the Future got it pretty, pretty close to Back what to we, the Future is, is pretty much bang on point if you say there's only a single timeline. Like yes, that's it. That that's it. If you're not, but that's the problem where you come in with multiverses, and that's where mm-hmm. I think that's all some Fugazi not, shit. Not only that, you also have one of the worst <laughs> inventions mm-hmm. introduced to the Flash character by Mark Wade, which is the Speed Force, which is basically him I, saying, "I need a yes. Deus Ex Machina to uh, explain this type of stuff." And Star Wars is popular, so I'll I'll I just steal from that. Oh, I hate sick. it. It ruins the character so well, much. And then it became the team thing, and then also everybody's a speedster. Oh, star. every oh, show was, was a team. team. Every <laughs> show was a team, <laughs> and then everyone well, had so, powers, and the supporting yeah. characters, supporting characters had powers. There was I, there. They ruined Barry was, Allen too. Oh man! Because I hate this him. bullshit about um uh, his mother being murdered by uh, Eobard Thawne. Mm-hmm. That sucks. Just why couldn't he be the one hero that didn't have a tragic backstory? Every hero has to have a parent murdered or someone like that. He was the one guy that until, until that was retconned into his origin, that he was just he ended up with the superpowers like his like his idol of super comic book character that he loved, Jay Garrick, and he said he decided to be a superhero because that's what a good guy would do. Not with this stupid tragic backstory about his mother. I hate every inch of that. See that story doesn't need to be part of his origin. It needs to be part. It needs to be like just a run, like on the level of like you know demon in a bottle or something of that nature. Where Eubod does that, and he's tasked to figure out, well, why is my life different, and why is something wrong? I discovers that yeah. resets it how it normally is, and he's back at of it. that flash. But the thing is, yeah. they never, they were not thinking of it that way. They're like, no, no, no. We we are of the childish, and this is a very childish perspective of how a superhero is born. Is well, they have to have had suffered a tragedy with regards to their parents. I think that was John's or Wade, one of those guys. And I hate it. I hate every inch of uh, the whole his mother being murdered garbage. But even even after his the father first, being accused, yeah. Even after that first season of the Flash, they they had issues. There was that guy that plays the the brother of the actor that plays Arrow. He was on that show, but then they kind of replaced him with another guy. Because <laughs> he can't act. Uh, you're talking about um, Robbie Amell. Robbie Amell, yeah. He's, he's not. He's a, I've uh, seen worse guy, actors. He was on the act. first season of Flash, and then he dropped the show. Never came back because he was ready to Firestorm. I remember that. 
he, 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 written out I don't think he's the worst actor. I'm not saying that he's, uh, you know, Christian Bale, but I've seen worst actors, worst actors even on that Flash show. And I think that what happened was is that they wanted him to commit and also say he would do Legends of Tomorrow. So that's also another problem with all their stupid spinoffs and all these different plans. Uh, yeah. They c couldn't even hold on to the actors they had that also were quick to jump ship. Uh, also, the guy that played the other half of... Uh, so he left, and then and then they brought another guy to replace him, and then Victor Firestorm, Garber, Victor Gar Garber also left. Yeah, Firestorm. Yeah, well, Vi Victor Garber just needed work in BC because he didn't want to travel. Um, he 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 was kind of on the outs already. Uh, Robbie Amell was written off the show, and yeah, they Ro probably Ronnie Raymond. Back. Yeah, he was Ronnie Raymond. Uh, right? But that was a lie because here's the thing: he didn't bring in an audience, uh, and he wasn't very good actor. And wasn't he playing Robbie R Ronnie Raymond? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I mean, like the guy that three, replaced the him. three episodes, and then they got a good. They actually got a better actor, a black guy who who um replaced yeah, him. Yeah, but that's Jack. still I don't like yeah. that. That's not the real Firestorm. Ronnie Raymond is no. the only Firestorm. Him and him uh, and Professor Stein. I hate that new Firestorm. I, I I don't think the guy that replaced Robbie Amell was a better actor than him. I think they were at at best on par with each other. And the fact that they introduced him and so quickly replaced him was already weird. And then the fact that Victor Garber didn't you know want to be on the show. That, yeah, the the whole thing just became a joke. This whole this whole operation became a joke, in my opinion. They did that so they could use the modern, updated Firestorm, the replacement of yes. Ronnie Raymond. Uh, which I exactly hate. why they did. Yeah, but but to me, once they cast it, and then they had the di the diverse replacement, <laughs> and that and show, they somehow yes. tried to explain it, it was so stupid. Awesome. Not not I'm not saying against diversity. I'm just saying that that specific switch was so stupid. Yeah, but it was done in the, the comic theme. first, and it sucks then too. So yeah, being oh. against that switch isn't being against diversity. That's a thing. That's it's just as bad. No, as it's whole, just wanting I to like see the original. Female. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just have a preference of who you like, either as a character or as an actor. And that was a really ridiculous thing. You can't convince anyone who thinks about it for more than two seconds how, how bad of a change that was. It, it it didn't make any sense, but. When you have the writing who was involved in the CW, of course they could never make it make sense that their lives were dependent on it. But they expect you to just play dumb and go along with it. And, well, the five people that are left watching that all the way through Batwoman bought it. And now they're no more. Yep. Oh, man. That, Basically, that, CW is garbage, yo. I, 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 I will admit I was a fan of the flash season one i had my gripes with it i'll say that i had my gripes but I, oh, there overall there's things i liked about it and then two i was, I was like oh, okay there's things i like but now my gripes are getting a little bigger and then season three happened with the we are the flash and i noticed the uh, bumping up we of are the Iris's flash was role. the beginning of the end oh well, well, that, this way. when you finally done. get to see a bunch of characters on the page on the screen you are very forgiving at first until mm -hmm. you start realizing what's actually going on. Yeah, of course. And, oh, no. and like there's I nothing said, wrong with that. And I said I fell out pretty early on, but that's been probably just because of yeah, my whole too. pension for repetitive characters and well, shit like that. I'm sick of characters like the Flash needing a Scooby gang. That really aggravates me. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I don't so like, stupid. you know, I like I've said before, I don't need 12 Robins. I don't need a Miles Morales. I don't need a pass a passing of the torch or a whole team or a family. Batman works better with less people around him. And now they're doing it not just in the shows, but they're doing it in more of the movies. They're even doing it. In, oh, they're so all ruined. For my friends who are that. reading, sir, for my two friends who are still reading uh, current DC, they tell me every book nowadays is a team book. Whether it doesn't matter if it has Superman's name on it, a Green Arrow's name on it, yeah, they're all team books. And I'm thinking to myself. Why do I want to? Why would I want to read that? I don't even care if there's a good writer. I want a super info. It's one thing if a character makes an appearance, you know, they're in there for an issue or a mini arc, but when they're in every issue, it lets you know that every aspect of DEI has infested all corners of media. And I don't want that. Like at that point, you might as well just call it the super family or something like that. Well, but no, they know that that doesn't have the the name, the, the drawing musical money power. episodes in the CW, and it wasn't out nearly anywhere nearly as creative <laughs> as the Music Meister one from Batman Brave and Bold cartoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, and, amazing, amazing. I mean, both Brilliant. of these things had a, a had a a profound effect on comic book movies. As much as we bitch about Marvel, DC already started doing this shit years ago. Between the Snyder Cut, 
or the Snyder business and then the whole like CW crap. It was right? the, Smallville, the Snyder stuff. Uh, there's there's four kind of shows that you can actually point to that that started this problem. One, of well, course, is Dawson's Creek. The other one is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah, yeah. Then you've got Glee and then you've got uh, Smallville. But what I was getting to is that Glee the damage was, was already done for, for girls. I, I don't know of a man that watched Glee. <laughs> gay guys. I, I but, have, uh, <laughs> I've yet no, to meet one man that, that watched Glee. The CW. <laughs> but here's my thing is, well, Glee was on Fox, but yeah. Uh, the thing is with this is that it destroyed superheroes already prior to the MCU because there was a time, and I swear post Lois and Clark where they had made a, a stipulation that the big, the big boys we're never going to go to TV shows. That's why we got so many Superman shows without Superman and Batman shows without Batman. And then all of a sudden, when things had gotten so rough, they're like, yeah, we're doing Superman and Lois. And I'm like, what? Since when were they going to allow Superman to go to television again? Now, I don't know if you had ever heard about that script, but for a while, I thought it from what I had heard from people, there was that stipulation that the big boys couldn't go to television. Like that well, was the why they wouldn't allow them. The, yeah. the stipulation was a budget constraint because they're like, well, Again, Warner Brothers spent a lot of money on Lois and Clark. Uh, it did return mm. well, but again, they we we talked with Dean Kane about that. Well, the other thing was a prestige thing, from what I heard. But yeah, then the the next part was that they because Batman was in theaters at the time throughout the nineties, they thought doing a Batman show would not actually be to their best interest, so they wanted to do something else. So the first show that was actually pitched was a pre Batman show called uh, Bruce Wayne, and it was pitched by the same mm. guys that did. Small, I've actually have this have the uh pilot itself. Uh, the, Gotham the, the High, script, not the actual. They never filmed it. It was rejected because number one, it was sucked. Uh, and then they yeah. ended up doing uh, Smallville, which got picked up, and then they got uh, David Nutter to direct it. Uh, the pilot. And there so was Birds of Prey before it. that. Don't forget that. Birds Terrible. of Prey was the season after. Did they? Did they pitch was a it cartoon? After? Yes. Okay. They pitched a cartoon um, called Gotham High or something. Almost like the cartoon Gotham High was, I think, almost a decade later. Um. Mm. No but time. what ended up happening is like the reason they got uh, able to pitch the young Bruce Wayne show and lead it into a Batman is because Warner Brothers was having a heck of a time figuring out what to do after after Batman and Robin. They had Wolfgang Peterson and uh, Brett Ratner and um, uh, another director all in line trying to do a, another Batman film like and a Batman Superman movie crossover at the same time. So they had no clue what was going on there. And basically the, the powers that be at WB were so frustrated. They said we're the, the heck with Batman right now. Screw it. Let's just try and see what we can do with this CW show that's kind of taking off. And then we will figure it out when someone gives us a pitch. And then that was when Chuck Roven, who had been uh, grooming and in the proper term, like, you know, shepherding, mentoring, whatnot. Chris Nolan was like, hey, if we can land Batman, we can then open up a whole list of budgets and, and green lights for other projects that you want to do. And so Nolan pitched Batman by way of just building that crappy Tumblr thing. And Warner Brothers ate it up, and then they made Batman Begins, which ended up doing a lot better than expected. And that basically said, "Great, we got a Batman movie. We have a Batman in in, in feature films. We got uh, young Superman in in Smallville. We've we pincered our audience on those two characters. We're good." Uh, John Peters had been trying to push another Superman movie for a while, and Brian Singer did his Superman Returns in 06. Uh, nothing with regards to. Superman Returns and Smallville conflicted with each other because according to the way that the rights were held, Clark Kent is can be used in either a Superboy or Superman. Yeah, and that's what I kind of Batman. remember hearing that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So I, I, I had people on Twitter saying, oh, yeah, Smallville was almost going to be canceled because of Superman Returns. No, never. That was never going to happen. No, no, Smallville no, no. They just couldn't. Years. They just weren't okay. technically allowed to do Superman stuff. That was all. Uh, no, I have a were. question for Clobby. They were, but they couldn't have him in the costume until the end and all that shit. There were stipulations the, involved. The way that the show is pitched is that he would never be in the costume. That was, but then eventually it became like like he was so Superman already that they knew they had to do something at the end. But yeah, no, like I my point was is pretty much what you're saying, but also that up until Superman and Lois, like even Superman was technically off limits because they saw them as prestige characters. Wonder Woman was another one. That's another reason why they never Some went people forward. Did. But David E. Kelly did a Wonder Woman pilot, which I have. It something. never got forward. That was what I was just going to say. There was one that was supposed to go, and that was around the same time that I was hearing these things. It was like, yeah, they'll do The Flash, Green Arrow, some of these other smaller characters, but the big three or the big ones or whatever being They're Superman. Yeah, well, yeah it's, it's they weren't allowed because... to do television shows of until Superman and Lois, and that was my point. Was I wonder if shit was so damaged by that point, they're just like, fuck it. No, it him had it. more to do with the fact that when they when Greg Berlanti did Supergirl for CBS, 
and he asked if he could do, feature Superman. He said, you can feature Superman without an actor, which means that he could be like a stunt mm. guy or something. Right. And, the and that's what I mean. Yeah. That they just didn't know. They didn't want to. It, there was an area of Warner Brothers that felt some characters were prestige, but really it was like, if we can get them to work on television, we'll do it. The problem is nobody could figure out how to do it on television. Well, um, and I, this is from my memory, because like on the Birds of Prey, for instance, they were allowed to use Batman once. And that was it <laughs> just in the pilot episode or whatever. And they, in flashbacks. And they yeah, yeah. The flashbacks, yeah. And in flashbacks. Yeah. Like, and that was it. And, and right. they wouldn't allow it to do them other than that. And they had to use, I think the Val Kilmer outfit or their, whatever one it was they had. They, on they, hand. Well, yeah. yeah. They used the, uh, the Val Kilmer outfit. The one of the reasons they did that is they said, if the show takes off, they want to be able to spin it off to a Batman show. Like that's the other part too. You don't want to anchor. You don't want to anchor a character in, an, in a show. That's not part of their name. Uh, to something else so let's say for instance you know let's say birds of prey did take off and they brought batman back for a couple episodes they said okay now we're going to spin off to batman well maybe the people that are going to be assigned to work on the batman show don't like the actor that was cast as batman which is actually an issue that happened with the superman lois thing a very the very thing in smallville wasn't it too when they were going to do the aquaman show Mm -hmm. uh when they were doing the aquaman show yeah they did not ask alan richardson if he wanted to reprise his role for aquaman yeah yeah, they got Justin Hartley, who in that and I have that pilot too. When that yeah, failed, that's on the DVD. They, off, they brought him over for Arrow. Uh, sorry, they brought him over for Smallville to play Green Arrow. Uh, and then when they wanted to do Arrow show, uh, the people of Powers That Be didn't want to bring him back to do the Arrow show. They wanted to do a clean break of that, and then they hired uh, Stephen Amell, who played I don't know who he played, but it wasn't Oliver Queen. Um, so it was basically just like, again, it was the same issue that Patty Jenkins had with Gal Gadot for Wonder Woman. She didn't get to pick who she wanted for that role. It was already picked for her by Zack Snyder. So that's one of the reasons why they kind of say, if you're going to do a show that's not going to feature these characters, we really don't want it to be the case. When Superman Lois got picked up by Greg Berlanti, the only reason they re- retained Taylor Hoechlin and um, Bitsy Tullock is because Greg Berlanti knew this thing was going to be an issue and he realized he's got to be the producer of the show if he's going to you know, mitigate this type of conflict. So when he brought them in for their guest parts in, in Supergirl season two, when, when it was sold from CBS to the CW, he basically said, all right, I'm going to put into a contract negotiating with Warner Brothers and with, with the CW that if we decide to spin off you guys as a show, you guys get your roles, no fans or butts. That's what ended up being the case. Uh, and that was the foresight. Not a lot of showrunners even care, or especially producers even care to do that because they only want to focus on the show that's currently in production, making the money. Greg Blanty had already started doing this with Arrow because he cast Grant Gustin as the Flash and wanted to prime. He tested the waters with that actor on the second season of Arrow to see if he could get a green light for the pilot that had not yet mm-hmm. been written yet. And it worked. And, um, and, that's and that was the method he did. So that's why you were able to see characters introduced in one of the in the Arrow or the Flash or the Legends of Tomorrow and 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 what was it? Black Lightning was the other one, and then Batwoman, and get them kind of uh, on their way. It was it was a really, I mean, you know, I don't like the guy, but it was a brilliant tactic to actually diversify and spread out more shows under under a single banner to basically make a lot of money which he did he made like tens of millions of dollars <laughs> having five cw shows on at the same time all that he was able to spin off from one main show but right. uh yeah like the the powers that be at warner brothers i mean even even to this day if you can pitch a a, a budget conscience and really fantastic batman show they will do it they don't care they'll, but they'll... all of that multiverse idea the sorry the arrowverse whatever you want to call it that he did every time he added another show it just diluted whatever he was doing which was already on the decline anyways and everything just got worse and worse so it was kind of this weird snowball effect that i guess it made him money but overall in the long run all of these shows are garbage a lot of them uh yeah. i i was gonna actually ask Clavi before what he thought of wally west on the flash cw as kid flash because even that guy i didn't even like him to begin with and then they said he's going to legends of tomorrow and then the actor didn't even want to be there i feel like every actor didn't want to be there yeah to me uh he's of course he's a diversity hire wally west so he just he's not the one from the comic um and i never accepted wally west as flash when they murdered barry allen he'll always be kid flash to me so I didn't think much of him. That was around the time I was I was getting out of that show. I was I got kind of forced, dragged, kicking and screaming to watch it for the first two years. And at that point, when he popped in, I was just like, "Oh, brother, 
Yeah, he just yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't care much for him one way or the other. He was nothing like my Wally West anyway. So yeah, I wasn't big never been guy. a fan of the character period, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm the a Flash very is one of those guy. rare ones that I kind of accept as a uh, whatever you want to call it secondary character, even though there was a Flash before. But that's just because this version of the Flash was around a hell of a lot longer, and it's the more oh known version or whatever but barry allen was murdered in 1985 yeah and barry already had a few decades under his belt before the crisis happened and then that's when wally had in for what 15 18 years that's my point yeah Yeah, well to me flash it's just i've never bought into it because i like the mistake flash I, I that's my point though is I've never been a fan of this redundant character stuff and i mean i'm not saying you can't let certain characters die once in a while but these are comic yeah. book characters. They're not real people. They don't age, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have. I mean, a, a, one comic no. book in 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 their universe can be a couple hours, right? So like, you don't have to like worry about real time passing by. It's not like a TV show or a movie where you have to worry about your actors aging. You know what I mean? It's it's like The Simpsons to me. It's like Bart doesn't age. He's forever ten years old. He will yeah. always be ten years old. <laughs> it's just the way it is no matter what the world changes around him. And you can do that in certain ways with certain things in comics and rebooting them over the years. But I think you can sometimes it doesn't hurt you to kind of reach an ABC point and kind of re, you know, take a break and reconfigure some things too. Right. Mm-hmm. So I love when people get butthurt triggered, triggered because I don't think that something is coming. I'm trying to explain it right now, Waverly. And it's just mainly yeah. because again, like I said, these are comic book characters. These are, I mean, if you want to tell an also ran story, that's cool, but I don't see a reason for another character to come. Like we already got a Superman. We already got a Batman. We don't yeah. need 20 more. They don't have to get old. You can tell a story about an old Batman. That's cool, but they yeah. can forever be 33. Right, sure. it doesn't. You know, I don't like. like I don't. I don't like I mean, the legacy stuff. But I do like sidekicks. So I don't know if you don't like sidekicks. Tom, sidekicks are confused, a different but, story, especially like Robin. Right. Like I mean, I like Dick Grayson, but I don't mm-hmm. need oh, twenty other Dick Robins Grayson after is that. A fucking legend. People, people like to project. Like says someone's complaining that I, I don't like. Um, I, every episode I've complained about something not being comic book accurate. But I, I don't do. I'll, I'll make allowances for things not being comic book accurate. I just say, name what I prefer. And I don't like that. I don't like Wally West. Uh, that change that was made, uh, which was from the comics, by the way. The, what, CW didn't change him into that. The comics did that also. With but, the New yeah. 52, right. Yeah. Besides, yeah. there's nothing, nothing <laughs> wrong with wanting an ex- the well, expectation of something you grew up with yeah. to match what you've seen. When you're it's the all, one who has that era. point of reference, you grew right. up in that saying, okay, exactly. I know what this is like. I mean, a lot of people are like that with Tolkien. A lot of people are like that with Doctor Who. A lot of people are like that with manga, even. There's not like, and you know what? They all should be like that, and that's fine. And it doesn't mean that all those people also hate the thing. It's just we're going to point this out because we have that frame of reference. No, and that's basically it. Like, I mean, I'm of the mind that unless you're trying to do some kind of unified universe, which is fine, like most writers should be able to come in and do their own thing on a comic book run for a couple of years. And I don't see a problem with that or just do a graphic novel and a story set. I mean, if an artist wants or an artist or a writer, I mean, sorry, wants to come in and just do like the entire life story of somebody cool. But to me, it's like, I don't feel like they should feel tied down to all these universes all the damn time. If you want to just come in and tell a story, like if I just wanted to write like a little Ninja Turtle story, I shouldn't have to worry about everything that's going on in the comic yeah. books right now. You know what that, I mean? That comes out as reser- as re- uh, 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 that comes out as a fault of the model that they had at, uh, when they started right. the comic books, which is a monthly. Um, it's like, oh, okay, we'll do individual stories, and then as they got more and more elab- elaborate, they're like, well, we got continuity now, so now we got to stick to continuity, and that hampered them. And and when they were going all over the place, it led to the eighty five crisis story. And then from there, they're like, now we're going to restart from zero, and we're going to make it more con- uh, more in line with continuity, but then. You got, you know, Legends of the Dark Knight coming in, which is basically uh, essentially Elseworlds stories and things factored around it. And then you've got resets. It, it's just they they screwed themselves because they weren't looking at it in um in a more concise way, which is, oh, let's just tell these stories. You don't have to pair them up into any particular continuity or order or or order. And if you want to tell a sequel to that, 
you can easily just frame that in a way. But then you had some writers that wanted to punch above their weight class and said, well, I'm not just going to do a sequel to this story from Batman. I'm also going to make it a sequel to the story from Superman. And maybe you throw in a couple of mentions to a, a, a story from. The, and I mean, uh, and you can have a universe like happening event where all things kind of tie together. That's fine. But to me, I think a lot of these comic books, and this is just my personal opinion, there should be a way of getting into them like they used to be when I was a kid and when everybody else first started get, doing these for many, many years where yes, they have a, a continuity, but it's also like a TV show where most things kind of end up the way they were at the beginning of the story, just so you don't have to worry about next week's continuity, but anything you need to know, they kind of address within the, the continuity of the story, right? Like the whole Stan Lee method or whatever you want to call it, where basically at some point within a Spider-Man story, you're going to, you're going to hear, uh, you know, the, the, the retelling of what happened to uncle Ben in some way, shape or form or something that kind of gives you that, as a, as a new reader, but it's not going to take you out of the story and completely take you into a flashback and all that kind of, you know what I mean? Like there's ways of doing these things, even just with minor co- dialogue to, to keep up with continuity for most, because most of the audience isn't stupid. Like they can hop into a story and understand little things here and there, not having to see everything that came before it. But to me, yeah. trying to make it all so unified and so bogged. And sometimes it almost becomes like an inside joke to a point where it's like, I don't get it. Like, because you're so bogged down into the continuity of everything. And that's kind of where I fell out of X-Men a lot because that almost felt a lot of soap opera-y kind of stuff. Oh, you kind of Because you kind of got to know all the ins and outs of the characters to kind of know what's going on sometimes. And you're just kind of like, yeah, yeah no, I just want to. Like a... Colossus had a creepy love story with Kitty Pride for a while. And, and he was just mm-hmm. like, I can't do anything until she becomes older. And it's like, well, clearly you have a little bit of morals, but Jesus, you really shouldn't be obsessing over a kid. Right. Um, yep. Claremont regardless yeah. but that's my point is like you you can do it in a way that like almost any tv show used to be to where you could jump in any show and still be able to understand it and to me that's the way comic books should be the same way in a way now i'm not saying you can't do a, a specific run of certain things but then your audience is in on the in on the inside joke right like that's the difference and then i know i got to go back and that's why i liked things like last ronin right because it's a nice little set series that i know i'm beginning to end and I, i'm not going to be bogged down and, and i don't have to continue from here even though they're sequelizing it and oh yeah off. what a yeah. bad idea I, I i say as someone who absolutely was over the moon about the last ronin did not need to take place at all but it's okay i substitute for saturday morning adventures and it's fun as fuck I, I got one uh, one one uh comic of that and that looked fun from what i looked i paged Dude. through it but i haven't read it yet it, it's so much fun they talk just like they do in the cartoons oh man it and like i can hear like the, some of the the cheesy you know music in my head for some of the scenes they have the you know the battle cry turtle power dude it, it's mm. so much fun That's i gotta answer a nerd question here yeah. uh how did they get a passed out kong well if you've watched the original kong v- versus godzilla they move him with helicopters so they probably mm-hmm. did the same thing here they just strap them up and move them around <laughs> we got super chats though throw them on a boat you know move them that way yeah too. well that's what i say that's they say how did they get him on the boat that's how i just said they just moved him with helicopters probably or cranes you need about 20 of them but yeah <laughs> uh cc karaoke sending in a uh is this a pooper sticker yeah yep. it's a pooper sticker oh you're one of the rare people i'd allow that from but thank you sir <laughs> A <laughs> pooper sticker. Thank you. Kalekioki's here and says, where do you guys see streaming in the future? Which streaming services will remain? Do you think Lanier will ever make a comeback? Um, I'm curious what these guys think, but I mean, I guess my quick answer is what it usually is. Streaming is technically the new Lanier, Lanier. television, and it will, it will continue to look more like old cable as we move along here, but it'll just be through a different means, basically. Um, as far mm-hmm. as it was all a sham. I, yeah. Well, <laughs> well I, the beauty of this is on the other end of it, I say, look at the bright side is that we got out from underneath the thumb of these cable companies, right? Cause you can cancel and subscribe to any of these streaming services at any time. A lot and you're easier. not stuck yeah. into some stupid contract. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause that's yeah, one thing that- like my d- dad was always griping about and be- dealing with, cause he's still got a situation where like direct TV says he owes them money and shit, even though he never had them mm-hmm. cooked up. And it's like a weird fucking, like you're always constantly dealing with shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, what you'll end up having is you will basically be able to watch your half hour or hour television show and it'll have ads on it. 
But mm -hmm. when you do the math at the end of the day, you'll you'll be paying less for those streaming services combined than you would be for a traditional cable package. Yes. And you know and what you, you guys also got? Lot... Nick, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say, you don't have to have every streaming service because every time, and I hear this, whether I uh, know I'm at like a family outing or even at like at some social gathering, people are saying, oh, I got signed up for another streaming service. And I tell you, you don't have to sign up for all of them. You the whole beauty of the, the streaming service thing is picking and choosing your battles. A lot of us complained about one of the biggest issues with cable is that there are hundreds of channels and we only ultimately watch five of them. Pick and choose your battles. This is, we keep talking about how we want to save our money. Well, this is your opportunity. You know what? Maybe keep track for one month. If there's something you really want to watch that bad, get for one month, make it your personal responsibility to unsub right after. Like, it's not hard. Like, I do that. I've done that. I don't have every streaming service. I pay for all the streaming services I have. I'd say it's probably around 80, 90 bucks. And that's only because a lot of them have gone up in price in recent years. Prior to that, though, I was probably paying like 65, 70 bucks. That's so still a third I don't... of what a traditional cable package is. A Thank month, so you're... you, script. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is I'm saving all that money. And it's like, I remember I got, I think, AMC Plus about a year ago just so I can watch a little bit of Hell on Wheels. As soon as I was uh, done with that, unsubbed immediately. It's Not only that, we're going, to be, getting, we're going to be getting consolidated um, third-party streamers, which they will have access to popular shows that have been licensed okay. out to them by the bigger streamers that you can get for a lot cheaper. Tubi has already mm -hmm. got this right now. Uh, Hulu had this model. I think there's going to be another one launching in the next five or six years. That's going to be an independent, like Hulu again, independent where whether it's over the air or whether it's premiering on a, a prestigious streaming service, you will find it on Hulu within 72 hours. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's and the catch they used to have. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's what I loved about having Hulu and Netflix because and that's where Andre was right about them being more of a format than a service. But cause like you just said, Hulu would have the television the next day. So I had that covered. Netflix would have all my movies and their original material. So I had that covered. Um, as far as like, I think like the, th the other thing I was going to say when, when I accidentally bumped into Nick, there was like, my mom is a good example of where the gap is, right? Because you have the younger crowd, who are all in on streaming us who are very leery of it. And the older generation who just don't even know how to deal with it or want to deal with it. What they have is like this FUBU TV and some of these other things that are basically a streaming service, but they're also just like, they run like a cable service. So like my mom can still have like cable satellite and she can use it that way, but she can also do the, the DVR type. So, so to her, it's almost like a more of a gradual transition. And I mean, to me, it's kind of like a cable thing already, and I don't agree with how much it costs, but it already it, is. But yeah, to where it works for them, so I don't, you know, I don't shit on it. But like, mm -hmm. to me, you guys are hitting the nail on the head. Most people, I think, from here on forward, will have like everybody already pretty much has Amazon Prime already just for the shipping. So you have people who already have that. Most people are going to hang on to Netflix, and then they'll bounce around between all the rest of them. I bet that's kind of yeah. what will happen. Um, just, and just to add to this yeah go ahead. i like i like where you're all going with this and it's just playing off the idea i already had in my head then they need to get back to appointment viewing fomo right they need to have the shows premiere in prime time not at midnight but at prime time after dinner at the same time every week and there's no pause button there's no rewind button it simply, I mean, some people will get around it, of course, but the majority of the audience isn't going to bother trying to, to modify it, to, to pirate it, right? Mm -hmm. For the majority of the audience, you got to be there when it's airing, it's live, and if you miss it, you miss it. And you you sell the commercials on that premiere at a premiere rate. Mm -hmm. And then... They tried that with Hulu. It ended up not working out well because people really? just would rather wait the next day. Yeah. Well, okay, well, I, the next day... Yep. Yeah. It, I it, mean, you don't, don't wait. Just don't wait till for, for one day. I mean, everyone's gonna wait one day. It's just like so, the thing is, is that <laughs> they, they would either they'd, they'd watch it regularly on television with their TiVo, and so that they could pause, mm -hmm. or they would just do it the next day. Because if they did it on Hulu and they didn't have the pause option, they would just be like, "Screw it, I'm coming back when I can pause this because I don't want to miss something." Yeah. Lit for dinner, bathroom, phone call, what have you. Um, 
there's got to be a way to replicate that. Yeah, like, how like, do, a, how like, do like, you like a live that sports back. event? I agree. You, you really do have to be there because it's like, you're not going to rewatch yeah. a well, sports. Well, sports, sports is really what's like, going to change this yeah. up. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. script. Well, sports is going to be the there's certain live things that are dedicated live things that you're going to want to do that you can take advantage of and have your ad pre premium ads on. The the mm -hmm. benefit to the appointment aspect of television is actually better for advertisers and for the um, streamers because you're no longer competing for that time slot. Like that's the thing. There was a lot you, everyone on this panel could probably name two or three shows in the nineties that they loved to watch that got canceled because not enough people watched it because it was up against a slightly more popular show. Oh yeah. And that Easily. is gone now with streaming because guess what? It yeah. doesn't matter. If you have two shows that drop at 9 PM Eastern standard time, mm -hmm. then they're each appealing to say 40 million viewers. Both of them are going to get 40 million viewers as opposed to it being split between 33, 33 million on one and 12 million on another, which means oh. both of those shows, if they are good, are going to mm -hmm. get, be able to uh, secure maximum ad dollars. And they're also mm -hmm. going to be secure longevity in the streaming world because one show isn't going to be able to cancel the other. In fact, the only way a show gets canceled under that model is if it genuinely sucks, which is no. way better than what we had in the 90s, where we had great shows that were fantastic, but either through terrible uh, episode order error yeah. for programming or putting being put up against a better show, it died. Mm. Yep. So, script. That's a fan, really fantastic point, and I want to add to that. So, okay, so you're on to something really good there. Well, then how what do we do then to make these shows feel like a can't miss event type of thing? How what is the step to. in that we don't because no, because it feels like there's, there's that lack of in yeah, and that's true. There there is that that um there is that convenience there is that convenience. It's just it feels like the event idea, like it really is it made it made things be, like the talk of the town. It kind of made like the conversation around the neighborhood type of thing and there's when, definitely when a lot of that loss other, that people was... catching things. Well, and I think what you're getting at is the whole water cooler thing. And I think people are trying to gravitate towards that again. And that's where things like stranger things and Cobra Kai and, you know, older but, shows that people are re re uh, uh, we watching discovering, stuff, but I mean, at yeah. the very least weekly instead of all at once. But I'm just like, yeah, the well, reason no, bringing the that up is because going to be there like with, with a sports event. Yeah, some people will record it and watch it when they get home and they'll try not to get spoiled on what happened. But there is a feeling about it's happening right now, right? And when that goal is scored, when that basket or that yeah. touchdown, and it's happening right at this exact moment, you can't ever replicate well, that by watching it the next day. The week. weekly that's model's going to help. Because, yeah, that's not the problem because I think something like sports or actual live events should be live. The problem is, is like if you're talking about a, a scripted show, it doesn't matter because it's as long as you do a, a weekly episode drop. And unfortunately, the whole water cooler conversation that doesn't exist in offices anymore. Doesn't. Right. They don't talk like that. They don't communicate like that. Communication is all done th through social media pretty much right. right now. And until that changes, you're never going to recapture the water, water cooler stuff. So well, what you really want to do is you just want to schedule to these. You want to appeal to the um, to the, the personal schedules of your audience. Mm -hmm. because you get maximum viewership that way and you get more consistent viewership that way. The reason mm -hmm. Netflix was able to uh, promote all of those massive numbers when they started launching their own shows is because people actually sat down and watched it at their own time. It's not 800 minutes within the first hour of dropping. It's like, no, we calculate over the three days. It's 800 million minutes over that, which is way more of a, a, a useful metric than uh, the traditional 20 million or 8 million market share rating that you get on a, on a network show because the funny fact is, is when TiVo came out and when Hulu came out, when you would have a, a show, even though I thought it sucked, like Big Bang Theory, that would get six to eight million a night. What it would get on Hulu would be two or three times that the next day. And mm -hmm. those are real numbers. Those are 1980s, 70s, 80s numbers. Those are legit TV numbers that you can make money off of. That's what you want to get for all the good shows. It, and if you do that through appointment television, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to be killing your ability to actually um, – Killing your ability to maintain good shows, which means you'll have more turnover because you're competing for the appointment slot for scripted stuff. When really you only want the appointment television to be your live sporting events, your live music events, uh, live comedy shows. Like if they did, if they did a traditional like the Tonight Show live, like when Johnny Carson did it way back before he started doing the taping stuff, or when Steve Allen did it when it was live, then mm -hmm. uh, those would be something that you actually want to tune in for. But really, you don't really need to do that for scripted content because 
it's it's already done like it's already been cut right. edited produced, and, and out there just watch it at your own convenience well, and it won't lose anything i mean we still have it from time to time and i think that when more the more shows go to a weekly thing like they used to and and why i bring this up is because i noticed that the closest thing we had to a quote-unquote water cooler show in a while would have probably been one piece um where a lot of people watch a lot of people want to talk about it it had that water cooler feeling but you're right script like the water cooler has now been replaced with social media so the water cooler is much bigger now and it's much broader and there's a lot of things that people talk about but once in a while there is a few things that people do kind of congregate around but you're right unless they're the problem with cobra kai as we pointed out before was you know it, it all dropped in one night so like after a week nobody's talking about it anymore but the other t- thing that i thought was probably the closest to another water cooler show we had in a while probably would have been yellowstone and that mm-hmm. completely obliterated itself with the kevin costner shit and all the mm-hmm. now the, all the infighting that's going in on behind the scenes but that's what happens when anything gets popular and there's money involved i'm sure but is there any costner chance involved, that they'll yeah. ever bring him to film his scenes kevin costner or that's or that's not i don't know uh, i think he felt filmed all of his scenes now not for the new one yet i don't think because uh, i mean I, I know he's it's at the tail end of season five it premieres this november it's already been shot oh then maybe he has so no but he, he's, he's i understood that he, he's stuff. not going to be in it the second half he's that's supposed- what i'm curious about because i've been hearing rumblings too that because he even said they'll have to sue me right so i think he never showed up for filming which means they're going to have to do a good times to explain his absence if you remember yeah, good times is uh recut him going into a helicopter and then the helicopter exploding <laughs> type Th- that's of thing. one option can't do that because he'll sue him if they do that because yeah, here's the not, thing he, is his character can't be killed off yeah they're they're gonna have to finagle it some way shape or form but um i want to get through the rest of these super chats here even though this was an excellent conversation and an excellent question spawning off a recent conversation but we That's have guys a mikey <laughs> joining us and uh, oh my god and you guys are shirt. wrong you guys are wrong about everything you've been talking about for 15 minutes what's that about all this streaming shit i've never paid more for entertainment in my entire fucking life than i pay right now how many all these services do you have so got, hold on let me get at least one minute in before you interrupt me, Nick. For all of the entertainment that I want to get, I have to subscribe to so much different shit in order mm-hmm. to get my sports the way I want it, where I want it, how I want it, yada, 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 that I spend. I mean, I'm spending double what I used to spend on cable when I mm-hmm. go to one place and just get it all. And yeah, I had a, like 100 channels that I never watched, but you know what? Everything I did want to watch was in one box and not in a bunch of fucking different services that's fair especially when it comes to sports because yeah i mean look dude, dude i can't right ma- major league network mlb network i'm a huge baseball fan despite the fact that i got the worst team in human history which is the oakland a's i'm a fan of mlb network guess what they couldn't cut a deal with youtube tv so they're over on hulu so, and they're not on regular hulu they're on the upgraded hulu so i had to get, upgrade that fucking thing then i got I, I mean you know i got youtube tv i got so much fucking subscriptions it's fucking ridiculous and i hate it all yeah i understand that part i mean me i canceled most of them i only have a couple now so that's part of where i'm at but i'm different but i'm not like most i'm not people, a sports person especially no, since either. i'm not a youtuber i'm not a you know youtube is not my soul that's what you say i'm not a you well if i was a youtuber then i wouldn't have all these other subscriptions well speaking of being here you can read your own member chat now Maxine yeah. iron man has been a member for 34 months showing his unbelievable loyalty as a youtube fanboy and not as a youtuber says you know which <laughs> you like that <laughs> you know which version of Flash super sucks? All of them. Zack Snyder greater than Flash and Speedy Gonzalez greater than Flash by a mile. Mexican mice don't need no stinking speed force. Damn Spoken right. like a true YouTuber. Wait, what? How <laughs> <laughs> oh, you heard of? Oh, Lord. You love Flash, man. Come on. Fuck Flash. Stupid as okay. that. Boy, Flash Flash. Also- you know what? If anybody wants to see, uh, we don't even have to do a Flash like re- live action. We can just like watch Fox <laughs> Media, uh, Fox News uh, covering the southern border. There's brown flashes coming across all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and they're fast. Did you see the way they went by the immigration officers? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, Nick, Nick, see how fast they <laughs> they're, like, they're like border patrol. <laughs> oh lord i didn't oh, see him but i believe you i believe oh you. lord well i want to get through these super chats because we got at least one more at least one more story i want to get through um right, but thank you mike for your no you're fine uh jason webster sends it australian 10 and says my godzilla x-con review three parts for me godzilla x-con new empire 
the weakest of the legendary films when discussing discussing the human fo- story still the franchise achilles heel you know what though i think that uh they did pretty good with this one jason that webster then good. continues the Kong sequences exhibited a slightly tired familiarity. Peter Jackson's King Kong remains the gold standard for Kong design. Oh, I hate CGI. that one. That's garbage. Yeah, I'm not yeah. as much of a fan of the design on that one. Yeah. Uh, Jason Webster sends in 20 more to finish up and says, the Godzilla scenes were the best part of the movie, which I enjoyed along with the final battle. Godzilla X Kong. New Empire is fine with a few good scenes, but certainly not a great film. I gave it a 6 out of 10. Ah, here's where I see your biases, sir. You are a Godzilla fan. That's why. <laughs> This, yes. was, this was a Kong. This, yeah. this was a Kong movie, man. It Absolutely, was all about yeah. Kong was Kong. I can see. Anything. Go ahead, if Kong, anyone's just... got, I can't wait to see this with my 11 year old. But look, dude, we got Zilla fans. We got more than our fair shake this year. This past year with minus one. Yeah, this oh, is more yeah. a Kong movie. I, to I be honest, movie. that's where I gotta stick up for this one and be like, yeah, look, this is a Kong movie, guys. It's cool. It's got plenty of Godzilla in it. He's got some great moments. Sure. Yeah. You know. But. uh Kong this is exactly my definitely. review, by the way, whatever Jason Webster is Yeah, saying. pretty much. And, and Even so though many it, people got upset at me. I don't know. If well, that's video. People got really pissed. Really? Because price at this point, how much more can you take the people out? Like, I mean, they've <laughs> literally streamlined it down to four characters who really have no more dialogue than to really just tell you what the, 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 the Titans are doing. <laughs> right. yeah, they're, they're just exposition yeah. they do they're exposition and virtue signal that's kind of like on the pre uh, on our, our review i'm like what else do you expect from this price like, I mean, like uh, and they, they gave us plenty of monster in this one and kong is a badass he's i, I really enjoyed all the kong stuff yeah nice. to me that's this film's accomplishment is you get a uh, about a not to get into spoilers but you get about a 20 minute or so sequence where there's absolutely no dialogue it is all Kong basically running the show and they do a great job of not, you don't, you know, fall out of what's going on. You know, what's, what's happening and everything and you're, you're engaged in it. So Agreed. I think people have fun with it. If you just go in, you know, knowing it's going to be like a Saturday morning cartoon. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all. No, like no, that's saying, what it is. You know. Yeah. It totally. Is and bad. sometimes that's okay. I mean, the movie makes sense. That's all that matters. It makes sense within its own world for the most part. Sure, sure, some of it's crazy and nutty, but that's what Godzilla yeah. is. So, like, not all of it's minus one. Sometimes it's this kind of Godzilla. So, very, very little of it's minus common. one. That's minus one's an outlier. I mean, it's, well, yeah, uh, and that's the thing people unique. need to understand is that's a rarity we get. Uh, yeah, there's only a handful of Godzilla movies that you could put in that category. So, but anyway, we got a lot more super chats here. We got Toxic Man Flu in the house who sends on a member chat for 25 months. It's 25 months. Wow. Wanted to say the entire panel is wrong about everything all the time, except for the Canadians. They're smart. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree. Why are you sucking up to the Canadians? You trying to defect? <laughs> uh, maybe he saw the fact that uh, our, our prime minister was booed, heckled, and uh, a protest was surrounding him as he's trying to enter. Oh, no. <laughs> good job, Canadians. Wow, Canadians are waking up. Anyway. That's what we got to do with all these freaking uh, wackos. We got to line up against them and use our numbers against these whining ass, bitch ass wackos. Right. Yes. Trudeau has very nice hair. And, How much longer you know, till you guys can vote him it's out? It's very important. Uh, that you have very nice. Governor hair. General has to call for an election and dissolve Parliament, and we don't vote him out. It, the Liberal Party votes their party leader, and that ends up becoming the Prime Minister. So it's not. Well, there's your problem. I mean, wow. We have no term limits either. Vote or no confidence where the party can replace their party leader. Put that out there. Uh, Look, that sounds complicated. That's another problem. That sounds complicated. I'm willing to like let Canada fall. Let's go save Scotland before it's too late. (laughs) (laughs) Scotland's in a lot of trouble, man. Oh my god, yeah. So you want to make Scotland the 52nd state? Is that what you're saying, Mikey? Well, I was going to go visit there, but shit, not after what's... Well, you know consider, me and, what is it? Uh, you know me and my mouth. Should be a state. Yeah. I'll walk it is, up isn't one, it? Technically. Territory. I'll walk up to one of those bathrooms like, hey, how come there's not a men's sign on the bathroom? Are we a bunch of transgender wackos in this country? Oh, the Scots have always been kind of weird. Anyway, Ooh. Morgan King sends in a member chat for 31 months. Thank you for that. D-Bud Martin's in the house, and he says, Toxie's wrong. The entire D-Bud. panel is right. About Mexican Iron Man being the greatest of all YouTubers. Hail Mikey, Elf, and Fanta. I can't be the greatest YouTuber if I'm not even... We got a lot of debate about this, so yeah. And then Marx has been a member for 35 months. Thank you for that. Toxic Man Flu sends in two bucks and says, D-Bud is wrong about me being wrong. 
Did you ask him to calm down, Toxic Man Flu? I think they're both right. Uh, <laughs> Carlos Alfredo <laughs> Lopez has been a member for two months and says, Hail me, channel and Pat. Mike, Epa, Epa, Andale, 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 Andale. Hola. That is that is the war cry. That 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 right there for Speedy Gonzalez I know. is like Braveheart asking for or screaming out for freedom. Speedy it's Gonzalez uses Speedy Gonzalez uses the speed force. It's the only reason I know those words. Speedy Gonzalez remember. eats cheese and goes. That's how we do it in Mexico. We don't need <laughs> a fucking speed force. You don't use speed force? No. Okay. See. See. Get flash. Oh, look, my superpowers. <laughs> I can run fast. Par for the course what, when you grow up Mexican. So does Speedy. He does the same thing as Flash does. I was in a tactical training this past or this past Saturday, and they we did this drill where like uh, you have to like act like you're in a a a, sh uh, a real world shooting like at a mall, and the cops mm -hmm. like mistake you for not being a good guy, and that and they come and arrest you. So they put, actually put me in handcuffs, and so like everybody's like, "Hey, how you doing?" I'm like, "I'm like, I'm Mexican. I've been here before." <laughs> God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shit. Dear sends in five and says, see how fast Mexican Iron Man jumped on the panel because people were wrong on the internet. Very YouTube behavior. Oh, he's got you there. YouTuber Shit. behavior, even. Yes. Shit. Yes, he does. Uh, well, to be fair, I did text him in the background, be like, where are you yeah, at? I was summoned. <laughs> I was summoned. <laughs> that doesn't count. Like, I see you summoned in the chat. My lady. Motherfucker. That's right. Even Sadie's like, yeah, where are you at? <laughs> yeah. That's right, Sadie. Uh, yeah, D-Bud says, Toxie is wrong about me being wrong about him being wrong for $5. Thank you so right. much, D-Bud. I right. think you're right. That's a good point. Even Sadie agrees, see? And then Nick sends it a five, even though he's on the panel. He says, I'm right about what the other guys are saying. I'm wrong about because I said I am. Yes. <laughs> I agree I think Sadie disagrees now. Uh, I think she's got to go potty. I'll be right back. If uh, Actually, uh, Mikey, you want to read this one for me? Yeah, I can keep going. Although I'm not a YouTuber, so I can't guarantee the results will be good. Uh, let's see. Did we read this one already? Nope. No. Toxic Man Flu for five dollars says DB Martin is wrong about me being wrong about him being wrong about his incorrect take on the panel being always wrong. Also, King Kong sucks dong. Only a read you could YouTuber could have read it that well. You know what, Colby? You yes, love sir. you, but you zip it so softly. Oh, okay. On, Toxic Man Flu again for $2 says, Oh, DB Martin, have you tried calming down? Uh oh. Calming no. down. All right. That's a calm guy. That's it for Super Chats. I feel like we should play a video for all those. Have you tried calming down? That's the real calming question here. I uh -huh. asked Sadie if she calmed down and she got very upset with me. Uh oh. She's like, don't have to. Don't call me. Don't patronize don't me. Don't calm shit. down. <laughs> Fade in. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mikey, I'm glad you're here because there has been what? a lot going on in the world of Disney. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, Bob has pulled ahead in the votes. Is, is that the latest news? That's the latest leak. That's what we're hearing. I was like, so, that's all you want to say. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't this. know what else there is to say. I mean, by one o'clock tomorrow, uh, I got Rick Crair in the chat texting me on my cell phone. Uh, if you have an opinion, you are a YouTuber. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's like literally texting me on my cell phone right now in the middle of this live show. <laughs> so that's too look, funny. I don't think he's gonna win. I I I think though that he's not going anywhere um because right. he, got, he got a taste of what it's like to get close, even if it might have been only for a day or two. So uh, I'm uh, I'm in a much more positive mood about the whole thing than I than I was before. Look, let's go back to what Scripps said an hour ago or an hour and a half ago, whatever it was. The, gra the gravity of the weight of non-performance, you know, non-performance is like gravity. Eventually, it falls. You know, all this bullshit's gonna fall. So it just depends when and how. And Bob's not gonna do the honorable thing and step away. He's gonna declare victory. I'm most entertained by seeing what how Disney handles it if they win. Like I'm gonna see if like they're gonna do victory laps and shit. You Probably. Know? Yeah, because that's an interesting thing. And I'm with you, JB. It's not so much that I thought Pelts would win. I was just very surprised that he was in a position where 
I'm like, oh, so so much more is making sense now. Bob is afraid of him. Right. And here's another thing is that he's, in my opinion, and, I, and again, this is just opinion. I could be wrong. He's, he's painted himself in an even bigger corner because now at this point, if he does, if Peltz doesn't get on the board and there's continued non-performance across the board in all the different areas, and if they so much as even hiccup about getting his replacement on deck, like let's say he goes and renews himself again, then mm-hmm. Peltz is coming back harder, stronger, with even more support, and then there's not going to be any case for defense to be made. Mm-hmm. Well, Pearl to be made honest, this, content, uh, this comment earlier, and I, and I totally agree with it. Uh, for, for me, anyways, the best case scenario is that Peltz doesn't win, but he gets a significant percentage of the vote, enough to make a, a statement, but not st- straight out win. Something like 30 or 40 percent, like something, something beefy, but not uh, actually win. Right. Uh, I think it's good to know that uh, Peltz actually posed as much of a threat as he did. Because, you know, I'll, 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 I, from, from the beginning to me, I was just like, okay, this is a guy who sounds like he has better intentions than Iger, but I don't know if he's got any, any significance. But the moment I realized Peltz actually had significance is when I saw a, basically as a political hit job ad that yeah. Iger had done probably by some other company talk about how Peltz is bad for a company. And, and as I listened to this ad, I'm like, was that a political like campaign ad? Cause everything that was said was spoken as if you could swore if it was like for like an, for an election. I'm like, I've never seen that ever just over being a shareholder and all this stock stuff. And if, for Iger to do that now over this guy, Okay, this guy is clearly serious. If he needs to try and make this a public situation, because most of this stuff doesn't ever get in the public eye ever. Most of it doesn't. But for this to gain as little bit as it did in the public eye, tells you that, yeah, Peltz actually had a uh, significance to him, and Bob Iger wanted to take him out. This is the most expensive proxy fight for any company publicly traded that's ever happened, ever. Mm-hmm. The reports are between 40 and $70 million spent in the last three and a half, four months on this. Wow. Thing. Can you imagine well, that? And here's the thing where I think you guys are all right on collectively what you're saying here. Cause he, he probably won't win, but I, I would like to see him have a beefy part of the vote. I think you're right, Nick on that, because if he wins and he gets in on the board, then he's, we've been talking about this the last couple of days. He's kind of stuck under their NDA of sorts to where there's not a lot he could come out and publicly say. But as long as he's still on the outside, and but he's still making him, uh, he's still being a thorn in Bob's side. That means Bob's going to have to conform in some way because he lied, flat out lied to Peltz before. To because remember, Peltz kind of went away for a little bit. Yeah, he says, um, "Yeah, we're going to do some cuts. We're going to work on a selection process." Yada yada yada, and then he did some quick cuts that were already in, in process, anyways. The Chapek ones, and. Um, yeah. You know, I, and that's the other thing. Bob's just such a lie. I love how he simultaneously Bob Chapek was the worst decision ever. Yet, meanwhile, Bob's the one that's put put him up there to be the patsy. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that that at least in that case, as long as he's still technically not on the board, he's uh, somebody who can tell us things that are going on and he okay. won't be afraid to publicly say them. Man, can you imagine if you let someone like me or script on there who knows our way around like these kinds of companies just for like a year? Oof. A I'd few let months boys ago, all the way in, dude. I could take all of us here on this panel, and I'd send us in different direction. I'm like Nick, go over to Marvel and find out what the f's going on. Script, <laughs> go around all the studios and find out what's going. On. Tom, get your ass over in Lucasfilm and go talk to KK and sit her ass down. <laughs> price, you, price, come with me. Midgets. We're we're going to the, some theme parks. <laughs> well, we can have I get to go to the theme park. The can I go with Nick? Bobby can have yeah, Kobe can have exclusive use of the F4. I think yeah. he wants me to just sweep Kobe, the floor. Kobe, you Kobe had script to, go, to have Kobe fucking Star Wars. Yeah, I think he just wants me to sweep the floors. No, no, no. Kobe, <laughs> Kobe, 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 no. Kobe gets to go wherever he wants. He's like the godfather. He's like, grand, he's like the grand poop. <laughs> I'll be your bodyguard. Now you might need a bodyguard. No, no, no you, we're going to leave you. No, we got to leave you in the home office guarding all the money while we go out and find out what's wrong. Because when we leave. <laughs> Yeah, so Clobby's a tre- Clobby's our treasure. We trust him. Can I, can well, I he knows things? all the comic book stuff. I was going to say, he knows all the comic book stuff. I was so I'd rather have him there. All right, Nick, you're fired. Clobby, you're Nick, hired. No, well, Nick no, can no, stay no. there, too. Yeah. All right, me, Nick, okay. Nick, you're going to Disney World. 
Okay, yeah. Price is going to Orlando. You're going to uh, Anaheim. And Mexican Iron Man's going to go on the cruise ships. Test them out. <laughs> I want to be the guy going in there going, you're fired, you're fired, yeah, you're, you're fired, going you're fired, you're fired. You're, yeah. fired. you're going you're in fired. with a pink yeah. gun. Just literally <laughs> handing out pink slips as people walk in the door. <laughs> Yeah, you I'll just let everybody a, around like me off each other while I sit around. in the middle quietly, and I'm <laughs> yeah, the only just, one left. Just get your shit and get the, and get the fuck out. <laughs> and then when Script goes in, he can't go in like as his real body self. He's got to go in literally. Like we're gonna have to like animate him so he goes in faceless and just walks in. Hey, white guy, new white guy in charge. I know a makeup artist that could do that for me. <laughs> yeah, like go in bleach or get out. like uh, like what, data. The, the the question or whatever the hell it was the character in uh, the the. Uh, the blank or whatever from Dick Tracy. If you can find a mask, there you go. Uh, no, glasses I, I and a wig on. That, but I, I know, I know a couple of makeup artists that can do that uh, live, live action animation thing where it looks like a comic book character came off the page and still retains oh. the solid black line inks and all that stuff. Mm. Oh, jeez. Mm. Uh, Goddess of Whim is just that. happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here, Goddess of Whim. Uh, David Mernon is here, and thank you for the Australian Five. Hopefully, I said your name right. Dur- Mernane, maybe, is how it's pronounced. Uh, Peltz needs an uh, Mexican ex Jedi accountant to go El Zorro and <laughs> liberate books from the evil Wall Street auditor. Yeah, you're going to be so busy just auditing the books, Mike. I can imagine it'll take you a year just to go through that shit. Shit, I'm not going to be able to go on the cruise. Yeah, no, just take him with you on the cruise. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're going to be throwing up anyways. You might as well be on a cruise while right? you do it. <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, so I didn't know if there was anything more you had to add to that. I know that's going to be heating up tomorrow. I just yeah, to that'll be hitting kind of hard and heavy. Uh, I mean, the, what time is the meeting at tomorrow? Let me see. Is it in the middle of midnight? I have no idea. It might new. be right in the middle of the show. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure we'll either shift you guys over from there to uh, Valiant or whoever, or we'll comment a bit on it before we head out. But yeah, it starts or we like could snipe Valiant and have fun that way. We could do that. <laughs> Oh my God, uh, that's so much fun. Wait Andrea let us, but there was an update to a story we did cover I wanted to get to here. The George Carlin estate did settle uh, the lawsuit over the AI generated comedy special. So it's at one o'clock Eastern tomorrow. Yeah, I was going to say it's a little it's like noon, so an hour after we start. Uh, George Carlin estate has settled the lawsuit over the AI generated imitation of the late comedian with the creators agreeing to remove it from their YouTube channel and podcast feed. Hmm? In January, the Dudesy podcast released George Carlin, I'm Glad I'm Dead, which perpetrated to be an hour-long special created by artificial intelligence. Carlin died in 2008, but the special featured sound-alike voice doing Carlin-esque material on contemporary topics like trans rights and defunding the police. The state sued, alleging that the special violated the estate's copyrights and its publicity right to Carlin's name, image, and likeness. The Dudesy podcast is hosted by Will Sasso and Chad, Chad Culting, Cultingen, Cultingen, Cultingen? I don't know how to say that part there. Within a week of the lawsuit, they notified the estate and they had removed the video from their YouTube channel, along with any mention of Carlin from their podcast and social media accounts. Under the settlement, they agreed to permanently, uh, a permanent injunction that bars them from uploading the video again or from using Carlin's image, voice, or likeness in any platform. Kelly Carlin, the comedian's daughter issued a scathing statement about the AI-generated special when it was first released, calling it a poorly executed facsimile cobbled together by unscrupulous individuals. In a statement on Tuesday, she said that she was gratified to have the situation over with. I am pleased that this matter was resolved quickly and amicably, and I am grateful that the defendants acted responsibly and by swiftly removing the video they made. She said, while it is a shame that this happened at all, I hope this case serves as a warning about the dangers posed by AI technologies and the need for appropriate safeguards, not just for artists and creatives, but for every human on earth. Uh, And then it goes on to talk about SAG-AFTRA pushing uh, for federal legislation that would make it legal to create a fake digital replica of someone without their consent. Carlin's estate sued under California's law of publicity, uh, public publicity law, and also for copyright infringement under federal law. In a statement, the estate attorney Joshua Schiller said that the lawsuit was intended to preserve Carlin's legacy and shine a light on a threat that emerging technologies pose to intellectual property. Settlement is a great outcome for our clients 
and will serve as a blueprint for resolving similar disputes going forward where an artist or public figure has their rights infringed by AI technology. He said, this is not a problem that will go away by itself. It must be confronted with swift, forceful action in the courts and AI software companies whose technology is being weaponized must also bear some measure of accountability. Uh, the special was first, uh, blah, blah, blah. And that's just crap with, yeah. So I don't know. It doesn't sound like, I don't know about any monetary situation. I would imagine if there was any money made from it, they had to probably turn that over too, or that was part of the, the settlement. But in the grand scheme um, of things, it, I don't think there was enough money there to be such a big deal. The only thing not, that- the, not, not like a huge amount possibly but i mean it got quite a few million views right i mean there was something there but but basically what i wanted to say is is this whole thing is dumb because yeah they removed it but come on if i google it now i'm sure i can find it somewhere so the the idea that it's not anymore on the internet because he just deleted the video from youtube is ridiculous for their sake i hope he cut them a nice check because or the company involved in that ai cut them a nice check to go away I really hope for them that that's the case because otherwise, I mean, they didn't really w win anything, really. Well, and I mean, I guess even though it's a settlement, it will be used as precedent going forward. At least that's what the lawyer is saying. So maybe. Yeah, settlement, um, if, 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 precedent, quote unquote, moving forward, that you put a thing, somebody sues you, and then after millions have seen it and it's all around the internet, you can pretend you removed it. It's not such a great. Uh, uh, future I can't case. argue with that. I really can't. You know, like I mean, well, the damage is already the done. damage is done. You can't reverse. We saw we sat here together and saw that stupid thing for. We sat here for for about an hour, half an hour. We watched a lot of that together. I watched the whole thing myself too. Yeah, right. Well, and I did two prior, but then we all even sat here and watched segments together. There, there's no way. And then we, there's no way you can delete that. There's no way you can remove what people saw. So, the da right. yeah, the damage is done. This this settlement can be used as a, an example to take up to a higher court to create a law and regulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what this can do. Well, maybe N not I maybe think... like that's what, I mean, listen, if, um, well, does that come down to SAG after then to do that, she can, yeah, she can hundred percent do that. Would that come down to SAG after pushing that or if, if, well, they could support it. Cause really it's just Car Carlin's kid right now. She's got the settlement. Right. She's got the, she's got whatever terms are to, to her favorability or whatnot. If she says, I don't want other people, uh, other estates of celebrities being exploited the way I was. She can lobby a complaint to uh, the courts and to the AI companies in specific that are able to generate these types of things. Or she can lobby it to Congress, uh, like her congressperson. Like a George like, Carlin like, like bill, basically. She's probably yeah. going to do nothing. She's going to go home, make herself a pina colada, and then go to sleep. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know. She's not, not the type of person that is just coasting off of her dad's. Um, no, I was going to say she's kind of got her own thing going too. Thing yeah. for a quite, but even well, well, we'll see how it develops. And she does take her father's legacy very seriously. So, yeah, I mean, it, she had to give permission to George so he could remarry because he. He did not want to do it on his own accord when he fell in love with another woman after he lost his wife. But uh, yeah, I just thought that'd be interesting uh, to to because yeah. we covered it initially. AI is stupid. Yeah, I, I think as I, I put this out there, this is misconception that AI actually knows what things are, that it actually nope. knows what a human is, that it knows what a hat is, or or what any object you train it on is. It has no idea. It has no idea that George Carlin is a human being. It it doesn't even know that. The sound of his voice is a human voice. All I can do is imitate what you're well, it on. We just and I'm questioning, music, and it's like, and I'm questioning how much actual AI was used in this. Like Script and I talked a lot about this one, and we were discussing, it, and I think we both came to the same conclusion here that this was probably most likely a collection of writings from these two guys that that is stuff that's very Carlin esque material pumped into either an AI generated voice. That is doing an amalgamation of, you know, what Carlin sounded like before he passed away, adding 10 years to it. Cause we both said it doesn't quite sound like him. Not quite right. It has some of the mannerisms down, but not the voice that or it's somebody doing an impression and poorly. That's yeah, basically where we came down to. Yeah. Even so we're not even sure voice, if it's really that AI generated, to be honest. Cause with you, you listen to the voice and it doesn't sound quite right. And you're wondering why it doesn't sound quite right. And hopefully it's not really deep cut of me to say, but in music, we've, we, people have tricked, 
try to train AI to identify individual instruments like a guitar or drums, right? And then so right. in, the, in, the, in the concept of removing vocals from a song, it's like, okay, uh, here's what the way, here's what the sound should sound like when there's no vocals, right? But what the AI does is it tries to match the waveform to the exact instrumental, right? It doesn't understand that it's removing the vocals. It it just yeah, it's a lot easier tries for to some... replicate. It tries to replicate the waveform that you provided it without vocals. And what it the, what what it, where it really fucks up is because it's doing that, it leaves vocals in the instrumental when it, when, when it more matches the instrumental. I mean, that's a little confusing me to say. But no, was, but I get what you're saying. It's no a lot easier for an AI is. to differentiate a yeah. guitar and a trumpet or a t- you know so whatever it has an no instrument I- yeah. than it is a, something like a voice that has so many variants compared to. So yeah. it has no idea what George Carlin sounds like. It's just, it's just, it's, it's literally just going to analyze what what the 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 digital waveforms of all his recordings look like and try and replicate that digital waveform. It has no actual sense of nuance for how he spoke, right? It's mm. just it's just trying to copy something that actually previously existed. Right. And it's like it's like this messy jumble of <laughs> Well and there's a nuance that no. AI just hasn't quite got to, but it, we're also getting to a point where it is. And I think that this is the time now where yeah, as but it's to get out ahead of it. Yeah, is my that's point. Sentience yeah. though, right? It's like I mean it, it, it doesn't understand how the pieces fit together. It no. doesn't understand why he spoke like in certain ways at the beginning of a sentence and the end of a sentence, like why we end a sentence with a question mark and how we like, when we're asking a question, we speak differently than when we, when we make a statement of fact, let's say it doesn't understand how that actually exists. It's not it's able just, to understand because it, you cannot can. program the concept of understanding. It has <laughs> like no concept can't. of any of that. Yeah. Like that, that's the problem. Like, I mean, like, again, cause I consult with these guys. Um, the, the, the thing that I really like about the team that I'm consulting with is all they want to do is they just want to replicate the computer that we saw in Star Trek, the next generation, which is the most safest form of like artificial intelligence you'll ever get. And it's actually the most useful, but you have all these other companies that are trying to go, you know, Blade Runner and Terminator and, you know, data from Star Trek or, or any other type of AI uh, model facsimile. And the when I see exactly how they do it, it's nothing like how they advertise on the talk shows. They keep saying like, oh, yeah, we built a neural net. No, you haven't. You have not built a neural net. You've built a co- combination of servers that you're using to write dat- write programming uh, for each other in a very cyclical manner. And you are calling that a neural network when it actually does not meet any of the definitions of a neural network. Uh, and then you've also got a very sophisticated matching system, matching and replication system when it comes to formation of ideas. The only thing it is useful for is solving advanced mathematical or chemistry problems. That's it. You, 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 it, oh, it, when it comes to creative works, it cannot do it. Um, what, when it comes to like, say making a movie, like there's that uh, YouTube channel that makes trailers set in the 1950s of more current area movies. Um, right. they requ- th- those types of AI require you to speak into a microphone doing your narration so that they can modify the voice and stylize it to another style that they're actually copying. It- it's a manipulation right. aspect. You, if you try to get the AI to generate that exact voice, um, on itself without any reference, it will never be able to do it. And, and that's, that's the issues at hand. It is just a very sophisticated simulation system. Uh, and it will never be never be artificial never be intelligent it'll just be a very advanced archive of things and it has no agency an intelligence needs to have two things imagination and a a willingness to do something without being asked and you cannot figure out a programming of that i disagree with that remark (laughs) i think you're wrong i have no ambition and what was the other crap you were saying and i'm a real man uh, you're Pinocchio, <laughs> Biden. <laughs> What's a Pinocchio? Exactly. <laughs> well, if Can you're high enough, it might go pretty deep up your behind. I mean, 
No, like the, I was just making first, a point there. I was, basically, yeah. the stuff that I'm seeing of, of what how AI is being developed is based on Google's initial semantic search engine algorithm, where it you you it can auto populate what you're looking for as you're typing it based on existing habits that it has that only you have put into, not well, necessarily your real habits, just the ones that you have on searching for things. At the end of the day, with this whole George Carlin thing, I guess to wrap this all up because I know some some of us have to get get going here anyway, and we're way past our normal due date. Um basically the thing that really screwed these guys in the, in the end of the day is if somebody exists, you can't do anything in AI without somehow some way using something of them from the past. Right. And this was the original argument. And I think why they decided to settle quickly is because uh, their lawyers were saying, well, to train this AI, if you were using an AI to do this, you had to use copyrighted George Carlin works. Right. And that's kind of the point that I always come from from the start is no matter how you say this, I like how you put it as simulated AI because or simulated intelligence because it's not real AI. Because real right. AI can create on its own. You still have to have some sort of reference point for it to work from. And especially if it's a copyrighted work or the work of an individual who is protected, which you know, all of us pretty much are in that respect then there's no way you're going to get away from get away with this. And this is why I don't even understand why there's such a debate or a problem with them coming up with the regulations for this and how it should work. It's pretty simplified. If you ask me, you have to have the rights to use stuff to, to use AI to create something, which is basically the way they work already in Hollywood, because to be able to even CGI somebody like say John Wayne, if they're dead, you have to get the permission of his estate. And all that kind of stuff. And if you use footage and other things from the past, you have to get those rights cleared. And to me, it's like it, it's just a rights issue at the end of the day. And I don't know if you agree or disagree with that part of it, uh, anybody. But uh, yeah, Nick had to run because we're going to be sending you guys over to Nick's uh, panel here in just a bit, guys. So uh, uh, don't worry about that. And thank you, Nick, so much for being here. But yeah, anyway, I just wanted to let you finish off there. And anybody else have anything to say about that? And then we'll get the hell out of here. No, I mean, look, AI cannot create anything. It, 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 I, like, I, I'm a fan of sloths, but uh, <laughs> there are some things when you plug it into like chat GPT, where it has such a limited reference that it'll always give you the same thing. And it's funny. And this is one way, if you want to test it yourself. All right. The thing with the limits with, with chat GPT and art, like AI art is it can't ever give you the same image twice. Right. Um, it, it will not take an image that it gives you and modify one aspect of it to and deliver you the same image back like if you uh you know if you got an image, uh, you tell it to draw you a table and then tell you to tell it to put a plate on the table it'll draw a completely different table with a plate on it and then you tell it to remove the plate from the table it'll draw you a whole new table but it'll still keep the plate on the table because it's, it's just stupid right yeah so it can't do that it can't create something brand new it, it doesn't have that that ability that, that concept but there's a few select things when it has such a narrow uh, realm of, of like of um, stuff like I, I'm not kidding you a sloth. You tell it to draw a sloth, it'll draw you the same dang sloth every single time because it has such a limited like training for that particular creature that well, it can't draw the sloth in a hundred yeah. different ways, right? So it'll actually just keep drawing the same one, you know. It'll well, that's what I was getting at too. Big. You're only lim you're you're only limited to or your your whatever you feed the AI, right? So like, yeah. Again, and this is the problem, and, and 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 I'll keep this short because I know we want to get out of here anyway. This is a problem I ran into one time where basically, you know, you base. I, I was sitting there with an AI and I was feeding it the first act of movies, uh, with as much detail as I could without getting into too much detail, you know, without sitting there for 12 years writing out the entire script basically and 9.9 .9 times out of 10 it would pretty much bring its way around to whatever the script was initially so like the story would finish out the way it does in the movie because it's probably just pulling from google or wherever anyway but other times if it would go off in a completely different direction it would do things like bring characters back that i said were dead and stuff like that already right so like there's sometimes like you're right like it just doesn't understand certain things and it just comes it would just come up with wacky nonsense and you know and in like Nightmare on Elm Street for instance it turned it into Rumpelstiltskin 
Like it was like really weird. <laughs> so like, yeah, like the, the it, it, it only knows to pull from whatever you feed it to begin with. And I know we're going to, we could sit here for hours talking about, you know, the different nuances of it all. But uh, no, I, I think that the, uh, that, I, that this is a good thing that the, they were able to uh, settle this and hopefully uh, George's daughter does push for some kind of regulation going forward because I think it's pretty stupid. Um, but Jason Webster sends in five Australian dollars and says, I love King Kong, 1933, Peter Jackson's King Kong, 2005. I find De, De, De Laurentiis's Kong a guilty pleasure. I love all the Millennium Godzilla films. I love them all too. I mean, I just, as far as Peter Jackson's Kong, it's just a tad pretentious. <laughs> it's just, Didn't it's good. Long. But yeah, there's just some bits and pieces of it. You're just like, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, I like, good enough. yeah, I'm of two minds on that, Clobby. I like that he kind of remade the original, but at the same time, that's what I appreciate about De, De Laurentiis' Kong is that they updated mm. it. So like, yeah. to me, like, that's... Oh, I hated that one more. I mean, at least Jackson's had some interesting, you know. Oh, cool, you yeah. Well, you would have been old enough. The, cool that's the thing. I grew yeah. up. You see, I grew up with De Laurentiis' Kong. It wasn't. I wasn't. In, it wasn't until I was like yeah. nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old, somewhere in there, when they started showing the original Kong on TCM mm, uh, that okay. I saw it. So I never saw the original Kong until I was a little older. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, uh, I saw it back yeah. in the theater in nineteen thirty-three. Just kidding. But no, you of course you were for, what ten then? <laughs> yeah, I was no 20, perfect I was age for it. I was twenty five. No, but uh, no, but um, yeah, no, I saw the De Laurentiis one in the theater. Before that, though, we there, sometimes theaters would show old movies, and I got to see the original right. there. But I just think uh, the De Laurentiis one is pompous and overblown. So is the Jackson one, but uh, it's got some cool scenes in it. It's just uh, again, I'm, I don't know. I don't know why he felt like he had to remake that movie, especially since he claimed to love the original so much. But what can you do? Yeah, well, that's remake fair. mentality. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, Goddess of Whim sends us in a super sticker. Let me see if I can see what it is here. It is a little Sheba dog, Barton Hearts. Thank you so much for that, Goddess of Whim. We appreciate that and all the modding you do and all the other mods too for all your help. I see Andy's out there, Mecca J. Uh, also saw uh, uh, Nick in here earlier, I believe. Uh, of course, I think uh, D Bud was here earlier too, if I'm not mistaken. If I remember right. Uh, I don't want to forget anybody, of course. But uh, thank you so much, guys, for everything, and thank you guys on the panel for being here. Toxic Man Flu is here in the chat too. Uh, cool. Yeah, there's D Bud. Andy. So, yes. Um, so let's start with you, Mike. Uh, since you're not a YouTuber, what do you got going on? <laughs> you're muted. Muted, buddy. I got another tax return. I got to do in the next three hours before midnight. Then I got to be up at six. Jesus, don't burn yourself out. I will. You will. I will. Love you all. Yeah, Thanks yeah. for having me and my you love you too, brother. I love your shirt, by the way. Yeah. Right, thank you. Looks really good, good on you. It's a good color. <laughs> Man, you're looking really good, dude. Keep it up. Thanks, bro. Uh Clobby, what you got going on? Uh well, I don't know if Loki's gonna have a a comic book round table tomorrow night, but if he does, I'll be there at seven on his channel. But uh, tomorrow night at nine, I've got my uh, wild card Wednesday night, and then Thursday um, uh, at nine, uh, the the clubhouse with Raquel and Mark, our Blake Seven episode review, reviewing Kolchak, the Night Stalker episode one, and uh, Star Trek comic review, that kind of stuff. And then uh, starting on J on J Man's channel, starting on this Friday at six central, we're going to start reviewing all of Jack Kirby's legendary run on the Fantastic Four, starting do four issues a week. And uh, yes, that's going to be a lot of fun. Issue one through 102 and then all six annuals. Oh, uh, and I was going to let script do next, but he's uh, you can check out scripts ch channel. Oops. And of course his Patreon. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he'll join us on the morning show. If not by Friday, he'll be there again. Um, anything else, Clobby? I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, we're good. Other than Saturday Star Trek is usual. But us. Thanks for having me, buddy. Good to see everybody here tonight. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> And thank you for being here. And uh, CC, I know we got Loki Oki Friday karaoke, but uh, I know we're lo also looking for another day to do it too. Uh, I can talk to you about that. Punk gave up on Saturdays, so mm. Saturdays are now wide open. Well, I mean, I got flash cast, but we'll talk about that in the background. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For the time being, Friday night, you can catch us singing karaoke. Sounds good. On your channel over there at CC Karaoke, one of the biggest karaoke youtube channels there yeah. is 
I'm getting close to 300,000 subscribers. I'm thinking the second week of May I'll hit that. Don't know exactly which day yet, but closing closing in on it. Nice. Excellent. And last but definitely not least, Mr. Price of Reason, what you got? Yes, Sadie. You were just out. Uh, at <laughs> at 10 p.m., I'm on a channel called Diabolical Souls. We're doing a, a review of Scavenger's Reign, which is kind of a trippy animated series. And then at 11.45 p.m. tonight on my channel, I'm doing this late late night stream called The Night Owl, so people can check those out. All right. And it, it was nice to see Mikey here. It's too bad. Yeah. Mikey should become more often. Yeah, if he was actual right. YouTuber. I'm so, learning about these things. I thought I might watch a YouTube video about how to do it. Ha! Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Mm -hmm. and with that and with that it is not time for koalas in the rain what the hell is wrong with you people that's right <laughs> Thank you, everybody we'll see you later we'll be sending you over to toxic tuesday while we'll be talking about the longest yard starring burt reynolds